Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are we are almost we are part one of our conclusion of the Harry Potter series. This tonight is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part one. I am your host, Curtis. Um, I'm also going to be seeing the description. I'm also going to play Snape, Neville Longbottom, and for for now, hopefully, and um, Xenophilus Lovegood, and a whole bunch of other roles. And we got, also got our Harry Potter returning, got Travis, we got Ron Weasley, Jessica is also playing Fred, George uh, Weasley, and for now, Dudley Dursley. Uh, we have Jade coming back as Hermione. We got Marla as Bellatrix and Dolores Umbridge. We also got Andy coming back as Voldemort, Andy Mort. We got uh, Anne playing Narcissa Malfoy today. Um, and Luna Lovegood, unfortunately not um, McGonagall until tomorrow, which is pop up in part one. Corey's back as Ginny. We got Colby filling in for Lucius Malfoy today, also playing uh, Wormtail and Percy. We got Molly playing Molly Weasley and Petunia. Uh, we got um, Jer Jeremy playing Mad-Eye Moody and Dobby and Arthur Weasley. Moody as Remus and Ollivander. We got um, Kenzie as Flor de la Cour, and also um, Lily Potter. We have Logan as Draco Malfoy and Bill Weasley. We got uh, Karina as Tonks. We got Hunter coming back as Hagrid, uh, also playing uh, Creature and Rufus Grimjor and Grindelwald. And uh, that's pretty much our cast. So without wasting any more time, let's uh, get right into this. Um, let me do this little this theme description here. Uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, screenplay by Steve Close, based on a novel by J.K. Rowling. Fade in, title card, Warner Brothers Presents. We push through the logo into a living, breathing daily prophet. Grim headlines sail past us. Death, paranoia, the world at war. We zoom into a moving photograph of the Minister of Magic, Rufus Grimdor, standing in the Ministry of Magic today, uh, addressing a sea of Ministry employees as reporters scribble intently. These are dark times, there's no denying. Our world has perhaps faced no greater threat than it is today. But I say this to our citizenry, we, Ever your servants, continue to defend your liberty and repel the forces that would seek to take it from you. Your ministry remains strong. Camera favors a pair of wizards, Yaxley and Pius Titmus, who turn away as we pull out of the photograph and sail once more through turning pages, the headlines growing grimmer, the faces more haunted, until finally we emerge from the prophet and find it in the hands of Interior Granger home, Hermione's bedroom, late after night raining. Hermione, she stares stoically at a lurid headline, Muggle family murdered, violence spreads. Hermione, your tea is ready, dear. Hermione glances through the doorway to the stairs beyond. Her mother's shadow clings to the wall, trembling with another shadow, that of a wind-tossed tree. It is strangely beautiful, and Hermione seems transfixed. Coming, Mum. Her mother's shadow withdraws, leaving only the trembling tree. Hermione glances once more off his troubling headline and slips it into a tiny beaded bag. Interior parlor, late afternoon. As Hermione descends the stairs, Mrs. Granger exits the kitchen with a teapot. Don't you look lovely. All packed? Hermione nods and watches her mother set the teapot on the table in front of the television. Just then, Mr. Granger steps out holding a biscuit tin. Uh, are you sure these biscuits are sugar-free? Quite sure, dear. See the big bold letters that say sugar-free? Dead giveaway. Mm. Hello, kitten. Don't you look lovely? Hermione smiles uh, warmly as her father gives her a peck on his head and joins her mother on the sofa opposite the television while Australian wildlife program plays. The bandicoot has small pointed ears and a long snout from which it emits a distinctive trumpet sound when agitated. Darling, don't be suspicious of the biscuits. Don't be suspicious. The biscuits taste so good. Be grateful the company is so clever. Hermione looks away from the screen, studies her mother and father. Slowly, she reaches into a tiny bag and withdraws her wand. Taking two steps forward, she points it toward the back of the head, hands trembling. She speaks, her voice barely a whisper. Obliviate. 
Mrs. Granger's face goes briefly slack as she reaches out as if to break a fall, then slowly her hands drop, coming to rest upon her husband's. He blinks once blankly and then enfolds her fingers in his. Hermione lowers her arm and eyes steaming with tears. Watch the photographs place about the room begin to change. One by one, Hermione disappears from reach. Goodbye. Exterior street late afternoon, uh, clutching the beaded bag, Hermione moves down a windswept street into the dying light. We boom up to the sky, hold briefly, then boom down to exterior front yard to borrow. Ron staring at the stars, he drops his gaze to the house, studies Ginny and Mrs. Weasley, a glow in the light of the kitchen, watching them with affection as if committing them to memory. His gaze shifts to the adjacent shed. Inside, Arthur Weasley is bent over his workbench. Interior shed, dusk. Mr. Weasley fiddles with a small radio, another half dozen in various stages for repair. Stand in line before them. What are those? Mr. Weasley turns and sees Ron standing in the doorway. Close the door. Ron eases inside and steps into the workbench. Mr. Weasley turns the knob on the radio before him. Static spits forth and a voice comes clear. Comes to us this evening from the north of England, where a wizard family by the name of Westenbur were found dead in their cellar. While not a member of the order, Mr. Westenbur and his wife had, on numerous occasions, provided shelter for its members. Arthur switches off the radio, gestures to the others. These are for the order. So many are on the run now, it, it helps them stay connected with the rest of us. No, they're not alone. Ron studies his father's worry face as the older man stares at his handiwork, places his hand upon his shoulder. Mom, mom's got dinner ready. Arthur nods, pushes away from the bench, and heads out to the door. Ron lingers briefly, studying the radio, and follows his father into the night. We fade. The tile card appears, and we dissolve the exterior night sky. A scarlet moon, a speck, a nightbird, or a bat, framed in the moon's surface, approaches rapidly, then whoosh passes beneath. Far below, sea treetops shift eerily. Exterior, Malfoy Manor, night, moments later. He plummets through the shifting trees to a narrow moonlit lane. A shadow ripples across the ground like a tight made of water. A boot touches up down upon the gravel lane, then another. A kick flutters slowly down upon the shoulders of a wizard. Lang here, splayed across his wind-blown collar. His head turns. Moonlight strikes his pale face. Snake. Moving up a wide drive to a pair of wrought iron gates. Beyond a large manor that has, been, that has seen better days. A rustling sound. Snake wheels, draws his wand. A peacock, white as it goes, emerges from the yew. Snake eyes it wearily, then lifts his hand. The iron gates turn to smoke. An interior Malfoy Manor entryway night. Fractured in the prism of a diamond paned window, Snape approaches the front door, glides open as he enters. Dark eyes and torchlight portraits crack him from above. Interior of the hallway, a door looms to the end of the hallway, reaching its Snape hesitates for a heartbeat, then enters. Interior drawing room, same time, two dozen figures sit silently at a large ornate table, illuminated by a flickering light of a fireplace. Snape studies the scene, and his eyes rise revolving slowly near the ceiling as if suspended by an in invisible rope is an unconscious woman, Charity Burbage. Severus, I was beginning to worry you'd lost your way. Come, we've saved you a seat. Voldemort grins, silhouetted uh, against the fire and gestures his seat near as his own. All, his, uh, all eyes follow Snape. All except Draco Malfoy, who nervously stares at the body above in a haggard Lucius Malfoy, who merely stays vaguely at his wand while his wife Narcissa looks straight ahead. You know our hosts, of course, Severus. Narcissa in particular has been our most hospitable. Lucius, on the other hand, is, I fear, burdened by my presence. Are you Lucius? My lord. Are you burdened? My lord is always welcome here. Voldemort smiles, his eyes shifting to Snape, who watches the great snake Nagini as she slopes slowly over the feet of those present, unnerving all. You bring news, I trust, Severus? That's what will happen Saturday next at nightfall. And this information comes? From the source we discussed. Yaxley, the wizard seen at the ministry, leans into a flickering light from opposite end of the table. I have heard differently, my lord. Dawlish, y'all, let slip that the Potter boy will not be moved until the 30th of this month, the night before he turns 17. This is a false trail. The Or office no longer plays a part in the protection of Harry Potter. 
those closest to him believe we have implemented in the ministry. Well, they got that right, didn't they? Haven't they? As the squat man tackles Weasley, others join in. Voldemort raises his hand. All goes silent. What say you, Pius? Pius Tignes looks up, his gaze placid. One hears many things, my lord. Whether the truth is among them is not clear. <laughs> Spoken like a true politician. He will, I think, prove most useful, Pius. Where will he be taken, the boy? For a safe house, likely the home of someone in the order. I'm sure there has been given every manner of protection possible. Once there, it will be impractical to attack him. We may have compromised the ministry, but there are those who remain loyal to him. As long as the ministry stands, his allies within will have the means at their disposal to ensure his safety. My lord, if I might, I'd like to ask to volunteer myself for this task. I'd like to kill the boy. Just in a whale rise from the floorboards, Voldemort's eyes flashed briefly with red. Wormtail! Have I not spoken to you about keeping our guest quiet? Yes, m my lord. Right away, my lord. As Wormtail scrambles up, Voldemort returns his gaze to Bellatrix. As inspiring as I find your blood blood, blood lust, Bellatrix, I must be the one to kill Harry Potter. But I face an unfortunate complication. It has recently come to my attention that my wand and Potter's share the same core. They are, in some ways, twins. We can wound but not fatally harm one another. Which means, if I am to kill him, I will have to do it with another's wand. The others at the table stir nervously. Belchard stiffens. Voldemort's narrow eyes break the room. Come now. Surely one of you would like the honor. What about you, Lucius? Lucius peers up, solo and beaten. I require your wand. Lucius sits mute, paralyzed by the request, scanning the faces of the others who avoid his gaze, all but Snape, who regards him with naked contempt, and Draco, whose eyes meet his briefly, then glance away. Finally, Narcissus' fingers lightly graze his wrist, summoning him back to the moment, turning the watches as almost imperceptibly she nods. Lowering his head, he rolls his wand slowly across the table where it stops at Voldemort's skeletal hand. Voldemort holds the wand to the light. Do I detect Elm? Yes, my lord. And the core? Dragon. <clears throat> Dragon, upstream. Dragon. Voldemort no, nods, getting a feel for the wand's head. And his eyes shift, casually just staring at the wand on the table, Voldemort's own. My wand? You can't possibly think I would give you my wand. Lucia's eyes meet Voldemort's for a moment to be speechless. Finally, his chin drops. No, my lord. Voldemort studies Lucia's bowed head, then returns his attention to the wand in his hand. Raising it, he points it at the body above with a flick. The body awakens, pushing against his invisible bonds. For those of you who do not know, we are joined tonight by Miss Charity Burbage, who until recently taught at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Her speciality was Muggle Studies. It is Miss Burbage's belief that Muggles are not so different from us. She would, given her way, have us mate with them. To her, the mixture of magical and Muggle blood is not an abomination, but something to be encouraged. I, of course, take a contrary view. But we're all civilized here, all adults. We can agree to disagree. Charity's tear streak face revolves once more to face Nate, her voice forced for her to stare. Chris, please, we're friends. Snape's face remains impassive. Voldemort's eyes narrow to scarlet slits. His voice hisses. Draco watches a teardrop strike the table. Avada Kedavra! Green light envelopes the room. Charity plummets to the table, body still. Voldemort ponders the wand, satisfied. Nagini, dinner. Interior private, cribbage drive, dusk. A blood red sky hangs over the neighborhood. Interior Dursley house, Harry's bedroom, same time, dusk. 
an eye shimmers in a shard of silver glass. Harry Potter's eyes. He tosses the mirror inside a lumpy rucksack, then has a locket, a daily profit clipping of how Dumbledore remembered, above which is a photograph of his author, Alphaeus Dodge, the Dumbledore, and a notebook filled with scribblings on horcruxes and the large block letters, the initials R-A-B. He gives the rucksack a shake, then glances about to see if he's forgotten anything. The room looks as if it's been bottled up and shaken. Dresser drawers turned out floor covered in uh, detritus. Come now, Dudley. Hurry up. Harry steps into the window, peers into the driveway below. Uncle Vernon rolls a large steamer trunk towards his car, followed by Dudley, who tugs an equally large trunk of his own. Harry speaks to Hedwig. Time for the teary farewell. And to your stairwell, front hallway, dusk. Harry drops down the stairs. The house feels barren, desolate. Aunt Petunia stands at the mouth of the kitchen, looking around. Seeing her, Harry comes to the stop. I lived in this house 20 years, and now, in a single night, I'm expected to leave. They'll torture you, even Dudley, if they think you know where I am, where I'm going. They'll stop at nothing. You think I don't know that. You think I don't know what they're capable of. Her eyes pierce Harry's. You didn't just lose a mother that night at Godric's Hollow. You know, I lost a sister. Harry's studies are taken aback. Do you have any? Magic? What a cruel thing to ask. It's there a private drive dust. Uncle Vernon tests the strap behind the trucks to a small trailer hitched to the back of the grizzly car and squints awkwardly at Harry. Well, this is goodbye then, boy. Harry, standing by the front door, nods, eyes Petunia, who sits in front of the passenger seat, a ghost behind the glass. I don't understand. Isn't he coming with us? Who? Harry. Absolutely not. Why? Well, because he doesn't want to, do you, boy? Absolutely not. Besides, I'm just a waste of space. Isn't that right, Vernon? Uncle Vernon stares hard at Harry. Hold on, Dudley. We're off. Uncle Vernon starts for the car. Dudley hesitates, then crosses the lawn to Harry, extends his hand. I don't think you're a waste of space. Well, thanks. Harry grips Dudley's hand and watches his cousin turn and lope back across the lawn. See you, Big D. Interior Dursley House, bottom floor, night. Harry stands rucksack over his shoulder, Hedwig's cage in hand. Somewhere nearby, a clock ticks. Otherwise, all is still, utterly quiet. He glances about the house full of shadows, like ghosts. His eyes burn with bitterness. Good riddance. His eyes shift. The last rays of sunlight lay like a stain upon the small cupboard door below the stairs. He lets the rucksack slip from his shoulder, sets down the cage. Interior cupboard underneath the stairs, same time. The door opens, Harry's face appears. Motes of dust dance before his eyes. He peers into the shadows into his past. A dead spider hang, hangs within an ancient web. A regiment of four soldiers broken and draped with dust line a, list, line a listing shelf. As the sun withdraws from the hallway, a tremor passes through Harry's face. And then, a tremendous roar murders the silence, the roar of a motorbike. Harry straightens, half believing he's dreamed it to existence, and strikes his head onto the low, low door frame. Interior hallway kitchen, Harry pelts down the dark hall as an opaque shape races past the windows. He trips past Hedwig's cage, sending it wobbling and flings open the front door. Uh, it's front door, Hermione flings her arms around Harry. Ron gives him a clap on the back. Others emerge from the shadows. Fred, George, Bill, Fleur, Tonks, Lupin, Arthur Weasley, Mad-Eye Moody, Kingsley Shacklebolt, and a small, dirty hangdog man, Mundungus Fletcher. Lastly, Hagrid dismounts a motorbike, trips a pair of fly speck goggles from his face, and yanks a small twittering bird from his beard. All right, Harry. You look fit. Yeah, he's ruddy gorgeous. What do you say we get undercover before somebody murders him? Interior sitting room, kitchen night. Everyone spills down the hallway into the sitting room. I thought you were looking after the Prime Minister, Kingsley. You're more important. Harry grins, and a tall, red-headed man, Bill Weasley, is before him. His hand extended. His face is horribly scarred. Hello, Harry. Bill Weasley. Wasn't always the Sansom. Jed Ugly. True enough. Or to a werewolf named Greyback. Hope to repay him the favor one day. You are still beautiful to me, William. Just remember, Floor, once you're married, Bill takes his stakes on the raw side now. My husband, the joke. 
By the way, wait until you hear the news. Remus and I are... All right, all right. You all have time for a cozy catch-up later. We've got to get the hell out of here and soon. He drops his sacks at his feet, turns to Harry. Potter, you're underage, which means you've still got the trace on you. The trace? You sneeze and the Ministry will know who wipes your nose. Point is, we have to use those means of transport the trace can't detect. Brooms, thestrals, and the like. We'll go in pairs. That way, if anyone's out there waiting for us, and I reckon there will be, they won't know which Harry Potter is the real one. The real one? Will you draw some class in this cloak? I believe you're familiar with this particular brew. No, absolutely not. I told you he'd take it well. <clears throat> if you think I'm going to let people risk their lives for me. Never done that before, have we? This is different. Taking that becoming me, no. Well, none of us really fancy it, mate. Yeah, imagine if something went wrong and we were stuck as scrawny, specky gits forever. Everyone hears of age, Potter, and they've all agreed to take the risk. Technically, I've been a quest. Uh, my name is Fletcher, Miss Potter. I've always been a huge admirer. Nip it, Mundungus! All right, Granger, as discussed. Hermione grabs a tuft of Harry's hair, yanks. Blind me, Hermione. Right in here, if you please. Rudy falls out of the flask, unstopper now. The potion inside begins to spit forth smoke. He hands it to George. For those of you who haven't taken the Polyjuice potion before, fair warning. It tastes like goblin piss. I have a lot of experience with that, do you, Mad Eye? Rudy's eyes rotates menacingly onto Fred. Just trying to diffuse the tension. Fred takes the flask from George, followed by Ron, Hermione, Fleur, and less than overjoyed Mundungus. He scowls as the potion trickles past his legs, and seconds later, his features, like those of the others, begin to bubble like hot wax. As a transformation completes, seven Harry Potters stand in the tiny kitchen. Wow, we're identical. Not yet, you aren't. Moody pulls the ties out of the stacks and pulls out seven identical outfits. Don't have something a bit more sporty, do you? Yes, don't fancy this color at all. Fancy this. You're not you, so shut it and strip. You'll need to change too, Potter. Harry, a bit self-consciously, begins to strip down. The others, meanwhile, appear unconcerned to be exposing Harry's body. Bill, look away. I'm hideous. I knew Ginny was lying about that tattoo. Harry, your eyesight it really is awful. Blimey, I almost forgot. My eye rummages in his pocket, pulls out a fistful of eyeglasses. Right then. We'll be pairing off. Each Potter will have a protector. As for you, Harry... Yes. yes. The real Harry! Where the devil are you anyway? Here. Moody's eyes rotate onto the real Harry. You'll ride with Hagrid. Right here, 16 years ago, when you were barely bigger than a boat truckle. Seems only right I should be the one to take you away. Yeah, it's all very touching. Let's go. As they file out, uh, grabs his rucksack and ponders Hedwig in her cage. He snaps open the wire door and she flutters out. Swoops down the hallway and soars out the open door. Harry glances one more down, once more down the hall at the cupboard under the stairs that exits. He holds on Hedwig's empty cage, the left her in the cage. Exterior, uh, Privet Drive. Uh, the other six, uh, Harry sit upon thestrals and brooms. Hagrid sits astride a, a motorbike, goggles on. As the real Harry appears, Hagrid taps the sidecar. Harry drops in. Good luck, everyone. On the count of three. One. Two. Agro kicks the motorbike to life, lurches forward. Hedwig scoops upward and beats toward the greasy moon. Uh, as Hagrid roars through the sky, Harry twists around, watching one, of, one Harry Potter after another whip past, watching Privet Drive grow smaller. His eyes stinging the wind, brutally lost in the moment when, seeing the sky, same time disturbance uh, fills in the air. Harry turns away, looks up. Death eaters drop from the clouds, around the uppers, flash the green light splintered in the darkness. Sparks explode on the bike's uh, chass chassis, and Hagrid howls in fury. Hagrid, we've got to help the others. Can't do it, Harry. My job's to get you where you're going safe and sound. Matt always orders. Before Harry can reply, four Death Eaters jet out of the darkness, ropes snapping in the wind. As one, their ones rise. Hagrid slams his hand onto a purple button with an air-shattering blast. The motorbike quivers and flames belch from the exhaust pipe. The Death Eaters scream, robes of fire, and pin a wheel away, free-falling towards the earth. What was that? Dragonfire. 
More Death Eaters swooped from the sky, give chase. Hagrid dives, plummeting from the ground, trying desperately to shake them. Harry watches as the earth rushing towards them, grimacing as the bike. It's your motorway slams to the asphalt and alarms wildly as Hagrid wars into a tunnel. The Death Eaters still in pursuit. Hagrid leans wildly from side to side, eluding the flashes of flight from the Death Eaters' wands. Sparks skitter off the tunnel and shower down as the sidecar rides up into the air repeatedly, then slams down onto the roadway. Harry glances back, sees the Death Eaters closing when the light fills the tunnel, and Hagrid roars. Uh, turning back, Harry sees a huge lorry rushing towards them. As the headlights grow large, Hagrid steers the motorbike directly into them and past uh, and up around the side of the tunnel. The motorbike loops the loop, and Harry dangles briefly, watching upside down as two Death Eaters fly smack into the lorry. Before the motorbike comes around right side up, shoots out of the tunnel and soars back to the starry sky. Hagrid and Harry soar higher, the air crackling with electricity as massive electrical pylons appear in the darkness. As Hagrid weaves through the towers, a gang of Death Eaters jet into view. Harry fires a volley of stunning spells, sending a pair of Death Eaters through sizzling wires where they dangle briefly, sp spasming before plunging into the darkness. Harry fires again, fires again and watches two others take evasive measures, unaware of the Death Eater closing in from behind. Finally, he turns. The Death Eater grins, wand twitching when Hedwig swoops down, playing into Death Eater's wand hand. Um, Harry grins triumphantly when a mad volley of wand blasts through the shaft motorbike and Hedwig is gone. Harry glances out desperately when... That's him! The real one! The remaining Death Eaters fall back and disappear. Hold tight. Oh. Hold tight, Harry. We gotta get you out of here. Hagrid hits the purple button again and the motorbike rocks his floor. Harry gazes bleakly behind and wins his eyes rolling back in his head, gripping his star. He squints toward the horizon, sees something closing on them. It looks like smoke, and he begins to take shape. Voldemort, flying, slowly, Harry raises his wand. Hagrid! Hagrid! Uh, Harry lets out a primal scream, his eyes clenched shut in the pain, his wand uh, hand trembling as he points it blindly. Voldemort's snake-like face draws near, his wand trained on Harry. Harry's arm goes slack, his wand dropping. Avada. Abruptly, Harry's arm rises as on a string, drawn up by the wand, trembling in his hand. Goldfire spits forth and crack. Harry sparks skitter up the chassis of the motorbike. Harry wheels and for a split second is face to face with Voldemort, whose eyes drift staring with somewhat thing like fear at Harry's wand. Then whoosh, Voldemort peels back forward away, evaporating like smoke. Just then, the motorbike's engines hiccups and Hagrid and Harry begin to drop. Put, put, put. Exterior to burrow, same time. And the motorbike splashes down into the reeds, sputters, and cuts out altogether in a smoking hiss. Harry glances about. A door opens in a crooked house. Two silhouettes appear dash forward, Mrs. Weasley and Ginny. Harry, Hagrid, what happened? Have you seen the others? Harry. <laughs> and he, look, um, he looks from Mrs. Weasley to Ginny. Ginny shakes her head. You were on us from the start, Molly, the Death Eaters. And you know who as well. Molly Weasley's face betrays panic, but she fights it back. Well, thank goodness you two are all right. I don't go any brandy, have you, Molly? For medicinal purposes. Uh... And she nods, leads him toward the house. Once out of earshot, Harry turns expecting onto Ginny. She looks frightened. Ron and Tox should have already been back. Dad and Fred as well. Suddenly, several yards away, a blue light burns in the darkness. Harry and Ginny rush toward it, just as Lupin materializes, cradling an unconscious Harry, clothes torn, head of wash and blood. Harry takes in the surreal tableau and watches himself transform into George, who bears the true damage. Ginny's hands fly to her face. Oh my god, George! The house! Quickly! Interior Weasley house, sitting room, night. Lupin and Harry drop George onto the sofa, where his head rolls into the lamplight. The blood more shocking here. Molly Weasley screams, George's ears gone. My boy, my darling boy, what have they done to you? Harry looks on miserably, anger and guilt clashing within him, when Lupin grabs a fistful of his shirt and curls him against the wall. Remus! What are you doing? What creature sat in the corner the first time that Harry Potter visited my office. In Are you office. mad? What creature? Uh, Gringolo. Lupin releases Harry, turns back to the others. We've been betrayed. Voldemort knew you were being moved tonight, 
I had to make sure you weren't an imposter. Who did this to him? Snape. He'll be fine, Molly. But that's dark magic. The damage is done. She simply nods, weeping, dabbing at George's face. A blue glow glimmers against the window where Hagrid stands. Someone else is back. Exterior yard to borrow night. Hermione and Kingsley stand together, looking shaken. As if the utters rush forward, Kingsley points his wand at Lupin. The last words Albus Dumbledore spoke to the pair of us. Harry is the best hope we have. Trust him. Shackle Ball lowers his wand, wheels on Harry. We'll give you away. Hedwig, I think she was trying to protect me. Just then, the yard glows a blue light, and one pair after another materialized Fred and Mr. Weasley, Bill and Floor. Ron and Tonks. Ron is still Harry, but Hermione doesn't hesitate and enveloping him in a fierce hug as he transforms back into his own battle-weary self. He looks mightily abashed to be in such close proximity to Hermione. There you go. Well, thanks. Deserves that. Brilliant he was. Wouldn't be standing here without him. Really? Always the tone of surprise. Are we the last? Where's George? Suddenly silence. Mr. Weasley eyes all, turns to Lupin. Remus, where's my son? Interior of Weasley House, sitting room. Arthur Weasley, trailed by the other, stops his bed. Maya looks up, her face saying in awe. Fred comes up on his father's shoulder, eyes stinging with tears as he sees his brother as if sensing them. George stares. Feel Georgie. Sight like. Come again? George opens his eyes, lifts a blood crusted finger, and points to the dark cavity in the side of his skull. Sight like. You see, I'm holy. Holy. Fred, get it? With the whole wide world of air-related humor on your disposal, you go for holy? Pathetic. Reckon I'd still be better looking than you. Looking than Bill, that's for sure. Bill doesn't smile. Next to him, Floor looks equally grim. Mad Eye's dead. The room goes still. Mundungus took one look at Voldemort and disapparated. Mad Eye reckons you know who would expect the real Harry to be with the most skilled or... He knew we'd be in the most danger. It doesn't explain how they knew we were moving Harry tonight. The room goes quiet. I shift. Well, one of us, that's mad. I'd wager me life it wasn't none of you lot. And if it was me, I'd know it, wouldn't I? Take talking me sleep on occasion, I'll admit, but there's only fang around to hear and most of these gibberish and... Besides, I cut my tongue out before I betrayed Harry, even in my dreams. Edgar stops, blinking miserably, suddenly all smile. What's so funny? I trust you with my life, Hagrid. I trust everyone in this room, understood? Understood. Yeah, yeah. Fred nods, approvingly to his brother. Better. <laughs> Here, Ron's room night. Shadows cling to the ceiling. Harry tosses fitfully, something bedeviling his sleep, suddenly his scar contracts. Grimaces. Lied to me, Ollivander. Into your Malfoy Manor cellar at night, at the bottom of a run of a run of rotting wooden stairs, Wormtail props up in an emaciated Ollivander. In the cracked surface of a tall mirror, we see Voldemort reflected at the top of the stairs, an angry silhouette. No, no, I I believed a different wand would work. I swear. Then explain this. Voldemort sends his skeletal fingers. Lucius Malfoy's wand lies shattered upon his ghostly skin. But it makes no sense. Perhaps our friend's loyalties lie elsewhere, Wormtail. No! There must be a way. I'll, I'll think of something else. I hope so, Ollivander, for your sake. I won't be so forgiving next time. The tear of Ron's room continues action. Harry awakens with a gasp, eyes flashing in the darkness. He eyes the shadows above him, then looks down at his hand where his wand glimmers in the moonlight. A tear staircase night, rucksack slung over his shoulder, Harry picks his, picks his way softly down the spiraling steps, past silent doorways, slipping in, uh, out of shadow. Stereo yard night, Harry emerges to the night, shifting the rucksack as he eyes the weeds, shifting eerily in the darkness. Going somewhere? Harry stiffens, turns to meet Ron's accusatory gaze, and continues on. No one else is going to die, not for me. For you? You think Mad-Eye died for you? You think George took that curse for you? 
You may be the chosen one, mate, but this is a whole lot bigger than that. Harry stares at Ron. The air is tense. Come with me, now. And leave Hermione? Are you mad? We wouldn't last two days without her. Don't tell her I said that. But besides, you still got the trace on you, and there's the wedding. Wedding? Bill and Floor. Mom's been planning it for months. Only thing that's kept her sane, I reckon. She'll kill me if I miss it. Kill you, too. Rather go face to face with you know who, if I'm honest. Ron tries to smile, but Harry looks foul. I don't care about a bloody wedding, no matter who's, whose it is. I have to start searching for the Horcruxes. It's the only chance we have to beat him. And the longer we wait, the stronger he gets. Ron is just there to Come boys. <laughs> Tonight's not the night, mate. You'd be doing him a favor. Harry stares at Ron, incensed by his cool demeanor, a common sense. Finally, he turns away, tosses the rucksack in frustration. For a moment, they stand like this. Harry's back to Ron, silent. Finally, Ron speaks. Do you think he knows? Harry turns his head halfway, but doesn't speak. I mean, the bits of his soul, the horcruxes, bits of him. When Dumbledore destroyed the ring and you destroyed Tom Riddle's diary all those years ago, he must have felt something, right? Harry ponders this, but remains silent. What I'm saying is, if we do find the thing right, if we find the horcruxes and begin to destroy them one by one... Harry waits. Won't he know he's being hunted? So Harry says nothing. Balance descends once more, then... All together now? Exterior Weasley House Orchard, morning. Bird's eye view, an enormous circle of silk flies, flies flat upon the ground. <laughs> As Hagrid looks on, Arthur, Bill, Ron, and Fred stand on his uh, pre periphery, uh, wands poised. A one, and a two, and a three. <laughs> silk rises, pitching itself into a perfect wedding marquee, trembling wondrously in the morning breeze, then collapses. Uh, interior kitchen morning. The Daily Prophet lies in the foreground, headlines screaming, Dumbledore's dark secrets. You hear footsteps send the stairs, and Harry's blurry figure steps into uh, focus and takes the paper for a closer inspection. Weta Skeeter grins up at him, holding a book entitled The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore. A bit further down, another headline. Think, think you know Dumbledore? Think again. Were you going to tell me? Harry turns, finds Ginny in the doorway in a beautiful dress. Yes. And Ron and Hermione, they'll not be going back to Hogwarts either? Harry stays at her, stares at her. She looks excruciatingly beautiful in the light streaming through the window. I see. Dumbledore didn't want anyone to know what it is we're doing. If I tell you, I'd be betraying him. Sit me up, will you? She turns. The dress is open to a small of her back. Harry steps forward and takes a zipper. As the panels close, concealing her skin, his finger linger at the top, lightly brushing the nape of her neck. They stand like this, utterly still, the moment fraught. Seems silly, doesn't it? A wedding, given everything that's going on. Maybe that's the best reason to have it, because of everything that's going on. Her chin turns, coming into profile, her face very close. Then she falls into him, and they are kissing, long, deep. George wanders in, brushing his teeth, pours himself a cup of tea, and sticking the toothbrush in his air hole. Leans back against the stove for a sip. Jenny, sensing something, opens her eyes and jumps. Harry wheels. George winks, tips his cup in the direction. Morning. Exterior orchard, same time. Uh, Arthur stands looking at a marquee from his point of view. Perfect. How's it looking on your end, boys? Ron and Fred look, bent mangled. Brilliant. Just then, silk snaps and trees in the surrounding orchard silver in a rush of wind. Everyone steps clear of the marquee and watches a tall wizard with grizzled hair and scarred cheek materialize. Rufus Grimdor. Bloody hell. What's the Minister of Magic doing here? Don't know. But something tells me he didn't come to give away the bride. Interior Weasley House, sitting room. Harry enters, trailed by Ron and Hermione. Scrimgeour gestures to the trio to the sofa. Harry eyes Scrimgeour with thinly concealed contempt. To what we owe the pleasure, Minister. I think we both know the answer to that question, Mr. Potter. Scrimgeour pitches a cloth bag onto the table before him. The trio regard it curiously, exchange glances. And this would be... Don't be coy, Mr. Potter. 
Mr. Weasley. Would you say you were close to your former headmaster? Dumbledore? And me? I don't know. I reckon I was just another Weasley to him. He was always polite. And you, Miss Granger, how would you characterize your relationship? We were friendly, not close like Harry, but... What's this all about? This, despite the fact that neither of your friends appear to have been particularly close to their recently deceased headmaster, he saw fit to remember them in his will. Now, why do you suppose that would be? Harry, Ron, Hermione, she glances again. No idea. Oh, now, don't expect me to believe. Scrimgeour reaches into his cloak, removes the scroll of parchment, leaves. Herein is set forth the last will and testament of Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. First, to Ronald Billius Weasley, I leave my Deluminator, a device of my own making, in the hope that when things seem most dark, it show him the light. Grimdor removes a small silver object from the bag. Dumbledore left this for me. Brilliant. Uh, what is it? Ron clicks it and all the light rushes from the lamps into the illuminator, throwing the room into total darkness. He clicks it again and the light flies back to the lamps. Wicked. To Miss Hermione Jean Granger, I leave my copy of the Tales of Beetle the Bard in the hope that she will find it entertaining and instructive. Grimdor reaches in the bag once again and retrieves a small book, its binding stain and clean places. Mom used to read me those. The Wizard in the Hopping Pot, Babbity Rabbity, and her cackling stump. Harry and Hermione stare blankly at him. Oh, come on! Beetle's stories are famous. Babbity Rabbity. No. Grimdor eyes is wrong with mild annoyance. Continues. To Harry James Potter. I leave the snitch he caught in his first Quidditch match at Hogwarts as a reminder of the rewards of perseverance and skill. Grimdor places a tiny golden orb onto Harry's palm where it glimmers dully. Harry studies it and looks up. That's it then? Not quite. Dumbledore left you a second bequest, the Sword of Godric Gryffindor. Unfortunately, the Sword of Gryffindor was not Dumbledore's to give away. As an important historical artifact, it belongs... To Harry! It belongs to Harry! It chose him! It chose him in the Chamber of Secrets when he most needed it! The sword may present itself to any worthy Gryffindor Miss Granger. That does not make it that wizard's property. And in any event, the current whereabouts of the sword are unknown. Excuse me? The sword is missing. I won't pretend to be your friend, Mr. Potter, but I assure you I'm not your enemy. You'll forgive me, Minister, but it's a little hard to tell the difference these days. Dumbledore said something very similar the last time we spoke. Grimdor gazes out the window, eyes haunted. Where's your god, sir? I can alone. I don't really need them anymore. That's what you think. He turns, then exits. Music is heard, and laughter. Interior of Sierra Marquee night. Uh, the wedding party is in full swing. Harry in dress robe stands on the periphery, absently thinking um, the snitch as Bill and Fleur dwell madly within a clapping circle of well-wishers. Harry's gaze drifts to Ginny, laughing as Fred and George rush to the dance floor, briefly sweep Fleur away from Bill, then begin to dance with each other. To Hermione, standing in black silk, to Ron, who ignores all, his eyes focus entirely on Hermione. Far across the garden, Hagrid wends through the tables in his horrible hairy suit and presents a slice of cake to a please Olympic Maxime. Nearby, Tongs hand Pantor Bell leans forward and whispers something to Mrs. Weasley, who reacts with happy surprise. Harry studies Tongs' belly. We want you to be the godfather. Harry turns, sees Lupin standing behind, staring at Tongs with affection. As his eyes shift to Harry, Harry sputters. You mean, but that's brilliant. I, I don't know what to say. Say yes. Lupin grins, claps uh, Harry on the shoulder, and hikes off into the darkness, joining the wizard standing guard in the garden's deepest shadows. Harry looks back to Tonks, uh, then notes a slight, tuffy-haired wizard, Elphias Dodge, uh, sitting alone at the table just beyond her. Hello, Harry. 
Luna Lovegood approaches the company of a cross-eyed wizard, Xenophilius Lovegood, with shoulder-length uh, white hair, the texture of candy floss, both wear robes, the color of egg yolk. Oh, I've interrupted a deep thought, haven't I? I can see it growing smaller in your eyes. No, of course not. Uh, how are you, Luna? Very well. I was bitten by a garden gnome only moments ago. She holds up her finger, which is seated in blood. Gnome saliva is enormously beneficial. Xenophilia is love good. You live just over the hill. Nice to meet you, sir. Love good suddenly clean, leans close, whispers fiercely. I trust you know, Mrs. Potter, that we at the Quibbler, like those cronies at the Daily Prophet, really supported Dumbledore during his lifetime and in his death, support you just as Williams. Come on, Daddy. Harry doesn't want to talk to us right now. He's just too polite to say so. Love his eyes burn with righteousness, a triangular eye dangling from the chain around his neck. As Luna pulls him away, Harry glances once again across the garden. In, uh, if Alphaeus Dodge sits alone, smiling absently as he observes the happy going, going on. Then... Sir, may I sit down? Mr. Potter, by all means. Here. Yeah. Nervous flutter, Dodge pours Harry a goblet of champagne. I found what you wrote in the Daily Prophet very moving, sir. I, I take it you knew Professor Dumbledore well? I certainly knew him the longest. That is, if you don't count his brother Aberforth, then somehow people do, never do seem to count Aberforth. I never even knew he had a brother, sir. Ah, yes. Well, Dumbledore was always very private, even as a boy. Sir, I was wondering if you'd had much contact with him before he died. The occasional owl. That was strange. Strange, sir? It was the owls themselves. They often arrived in distress. It was clear they'd travel great distances in some cases. Could you tell me from where they'd come, sir? I'm afraid not. Albus's messages mostly ref uh, referenced our days together as schoolboys. They were surprisingly intimate. When he did speak of his current activities, his words would turn elliptical. Still, I sensed he was under great stress. What do you ask? Just curious. I was close to Professor Dumbledore. Well, he treasured you, Mr. Potter. I can attest to that. I can also tell you that when a person passes, it's only natural to rue the things left unsaid. To regret the questions never asked. I knew Elvis nigh on a hundred years, but in many ways he will always remain a riddle, even to me. And that's that. This is Marlon. Don't be despair, Elvis. I'm told he's been thoroughly unriddled by Rita Skeeter in 800 pages, no less. Harry and Dodge turn, study the profile of an ancient witch, um, oh, uh, Muriel, sitting at an adjacent table, a glass of champagne cradle in the bony fingers of one hand. That woman is a vulture, Muriel, and you well know it. As someone has to pick up the bones to get the truth, I read your obituary, uh, Elphus. Lovely. But did you, you did skate over some of the more sticky patches in Dumbledore's life. I'm sorry you think so, Muriel. I assure you I was writing from the heart. Well, Rita Skeeter hasn't made that mistake, I'm sure. Word has it someone talked to her, someone who knew Dumbledore's family well. You and I both know who that is, Elphus. Monstrous betrayal. I can only conclude the rumors are true and that she has become untethered. Who are you talking about? Well, I don't suppose it'll be a secret once the book comes out. Bathilda Bagshot. Who? Who? Bathilda Bagshot, my god boy! She's only the most celebrated uh, magical historian of the last century. Don't they read History of Magic at Hogwarts anymore? Oh, right. <laughs> Slipped my mind. She knew the Dumbledores as well as anyone. She'd have letters, perhaps an interesting photograph or two. I'm sure Rita Skeeter would have thought it well worth the trip to Godric's Hollow to take a peek at that old bird's rattled cage. Godric's Hollow, Belinda Bagshot, lives in Godric's Hollow. For years now. That's where she first met Dumbledore. 
Excuse me, you don't mean to say Dumbledore lived there too? Of course, the family moved there after his father killed those three muggles. It was quite the scandal. Honestly, my boy, are you sure you knew him at all? Harry sits speechless and his eyes catch a shooting star or what appears to be as a plumbus it grows, gaining speed until it slices the canopy, exploding a burst of light, all go silent as a silver lynx, graceful and gleaming, materializes amid the crowd. When it speaks, the Patronus has Shacklebolt's sonorous voice. The Ministry has fallen. The Minister of Magic is dead. They are coming. The lynx vanishes. A scream shreds the silence, then chaos. Nice meeting you, Mr. Potter. Dodge extends his hand toward Harry when crack, he disapparates. Seconds later, the ancient witch has done the same. Harry scans the scattering crowd and meets Ginny's eyes as she gets confronted about. He pelts toward her, bouncing uh, between bodies, losing sight of her. Ron! Ron! Harry turns, sees Hermione glancing about frantically. She turns. Ron comes to the view, pushes toward her. Suddenly, the canopy above turns to ribbons as Death Eaters and dark cloaks and masks descend into the crowd. After Fair and George wield their wands, Harry sees a flower fall from the lower stair, watches it crush under foot, and catches sight of Ginny through the madness as he draws her own wand, copying her gleaming, eyes flashing. He starts toward her when Lupin crashes in, spinning him roughly around. Harry, go! Go! Hand reaches out and grabs his. He looks. It's Hermione clutching Ron's hand with her upper. She closes her eyes and a great whooshing sound fills Harry's ears. He takes one last desperate look at Ginny as he is thrown up and back in the whirlwind and all goes black. A horn blares as it steers Shaftesbury Avenue. Uh, a double-decker bus careens with an inch of Harry, Ron, and Hermione as they stumble into view. The streets teeming with drunken pub crawlers. Where are we? Shaftesbury Avenue. I used to come here to theater with my mom and dad. It just popped into my head. I, I don't know why. They hurry on, glancing over their shoulders at the dark shapes that move within the crowd behind them. Strangers bumping by, faces passing in a paranoid blur. A drunken man, a cackling woman with blood-red lipstick. This way. <clears throat> Exterior alleyway continuous. As they refuge in the shadows, Hermione begins to rummage through her tiny beaded purse. We need to change. Ron and Harry look at each other's dress robes from the, two, from the purse. Hermione extracts in quick succession two pairs of jeans, t-shirts, and a pair of light overcoats. Hold already. Undetectable extension charm. You're amazing, you are. Always the tone of surprise. As she gives the bag a shake, there's a loud echoing of heavy objects as if something has fallen. That'll be the books. Interior all night cafe, night. Shabby, greasy, empty, the trio slide into a boot. Do you reckon everyone's all right at the wedding? Maybe we should- They were after you, mate. We just put everyone in danger going back. Ron's right. Cappuccino, please. A gum-chewing waitress stands behind Harry. Ron clueless when it comes to cappuccinos, not as Hermione. What she said. Same. Wicked scar. So where do we go from here? The leaky cauldron? Too dangerous. If Voldemort's taken over the ministry, none of the old places are safe. The front door squeals, and two workmen enter, glance idly at the trio, and step to the counter. My rucksack with all my things. I left it back at the borough. Hermione is shaking her head. Harry's eyes defeated purse. You're joking. I've had the essentials packed for days, just in case. By the way, these jeans? Not my favorite. Bit tight. Hermione gives him a withering glance. Harry can't help but smile. Then his eyes shift to the small security mirror near the ceiling. Sees the two workmen turning. Down. The tile explodes on the wall where Ron's head has been. Only seconds before, a rope of green light singes Hermione's hair. Stupefy. The jet of red light hits the biggest Death Eater straight in the face and he crumples instantly. Expulsio! The jail behind Harry explodes and the spell ricochets shattered in the security mirror, sending shards raining everywhere, including one that laces Hermione's cheek and striking the cappuccino machine which sprays hot liquid all over the Death Eater. He bellows in pain and Hermione and Ron hit him with tw twins and stunning spells. As he spazzes him on the ground, Hermione adds another for good measure. Petrificius totalis. He goes still. The waitress steps from the back room, sees him through the wands. Her gum, her gum bubble pops. Go. She doesn't argue. Lock the door. Get the lights. Hermione throws a bolt. Ron clicks the deluminator, pitching the cafe into shadow. Harry eyes an unconscious Death Eater. This one name is. Raoul, he was on the astronomy tower the night Snape killed Dumbledore. This is Dolohov. I recognize him from the wanted posters. Ron rolls him over with his foot. Dolohov's eyes uh, shift uh, in fear from Harry to Hermione, then back to Ron. 
So what do we do with you, huh? Kill us if it was turned around, wouldn't you? Ron's face is hard. Hermione eyes him uneasily. He notices. Suppose it's him that did Mad Eye. How would you feel then? Hermione looks at Dolog. The moment hangs. Then it's better we wipe their memories. We kill them. We kill them. They'll know we're here. You're the boss, Hermione. He turns, looks at him. He reaches out with wipes a trickle of blood from her cheek. You're the best with spells. Shakily, she points her one at Dolog. Her arm trembles. Leviates. There's a flash of light, and we exterior, go on the exterior London street at night. The trio moved quickly, glancing about paranoid. How is it they knew we were here? Maybe you still have the trace on you. Can't be. The trace breaks at 17. It's wizarding law. Hermione stops. Harry and Ron turn look back. What? We didn't celebrate your birthday, Harry. Ginny and I, we prepared a cake. We were going to bring it out at the end of the wedding. Hermione, I appreciate the thought, honestly, but given that we're almost killed by a couple of Death Eaters a few minutes ago... Right. Perspective. Gotta get off the streets, get someone safe. I have an idea. Here 12 Grimmauld plays night. The door marked by a number 12, Harry taps his wand on the Weber's surface, and a series of metallic clicks are heard. The door swings open with a creak. Interior entryway of 12 Grimmauld place, the gas lamp springs to life, illuminating a narrow cobweb hallway. The trio glance about, and Harry takes a step forward. Some a snipe. Red eye? Just in a rush of cloud air sweeps through the hallway and the trio's tongues curl back into their mouths. Something shifts in the shadows at the end of the hall, rising from the carpet, tall, dust-colored, and terrible-looking, then rushes toward them. It's Dumbledore, but a ghostly, warm-eaten Dumbledore. A corpse come to life with eye, empty eye sockets and sunken face that raises his wand and then explodes in a great black cloud of dust, swirling like mist in the corridor, drifting back to the carpet. What was that about? Mad Eye's doing, I'd guess, in case Snape decided to come snooping. Just in the floorboard creaks, the trio stiffens, slowly Hermione draws and wand, pairs to the shadows. Hominum Revelio. Nothing. Hermione lowers her wand, explains. It's a spell to reveal human presence. She extends her hand, watches the selling dust stream through her fingers. We're alone. Here's Sky at Dawn, exterior mountain road. Uh, the view expands and a small village is revealed, swapped in the mist. This has this is the feel of a, port, of a POV. The image jumps and interior village street, the POV is moving now through the streets, teeming with cloaked figure. The tongue that is spoken here is foreign or uh, Germanic. Uh, you turn down an alleyway and the path narrows, the shadows growing more dense. Scratched into the wall is a symbol of Xenophilia's love good war around his neck, but the POV lingers upon it only briefly. A sign comes to the view, hanging outside a small shop at the very end of a dark cul-de-sac. Grigorovich, the wand maker, who cloaks quickly on the shop's door, catch a glimpse of Voldemort's reflection in the glass when, uh, in the drawing room, Harry awakens, peering at the cobweb chandelier overhead. He sits up, looks at Hermione, asleep up on the sofa, her arm dangling down to where Ron lies upon the floor, her fingers only inches from his. Nearby, the radio hisses softly. Distant voices struggling to be heard. Lumos. Upstairs, landing corridor, morning. Harry's wand blooms in the darkness as he scales the stairs and reaches the landing. He pairs to a bedroom. The drawers have turned, been turned out. The bed sheet stripped. He moves on, painting the wall with one light, illuminating an empty portrait of a muddy landscape. He studies it long enough that we will remember it. And the floorboard squeaks like the night before. Harry wheels, points his wand down the dark corridor adjacent. In a dark corridor, Harry moves down the narrow corridor to its end, to a doorway. His eyes, he eyes the nameplate, Sirius. Interior Sirius room. We watch Harry enter from unsettling low point of view creatures. This room, like the others, has been ransacked. Harry lingers by a photograph. In it, four young Hogwarts students, James Potter, Sirius Black, Peter Pettigrew, and Lupin, stand grinning before the Whomping Willow. Harry traces the thin cone of light of his wand across their faces. Books and papers carpet the floor. A woman's face, strikingly wise, peers out from a dust jacket. Harry crashes, turns the book over to read its title, A History of Magic by Bethilda Bagshot. Harry turns it back over, studies the woman's face again. He begins to rise when he notices a crumpled piece of paper embossed at, at the top of the name, Lily Potter. As Harry begins to read, we hear her voice. You're serious. Thank you for Harry's birthday present. You'd think he'd been born on a broom. James says he's got the look of a seeker, but then James would. 
we had a very quiet birthday tea, just us and old Bethilda, who dotes on Harry. Wormy dropped by late in the day, but seemed down and didn't stay long. James is frustrating, frustrated being shut up here, but Dumbledore still got his invisibility cloak, so he doesn't have much choice. By the way, Bethilda tells the most amazing stories about our old headmaster. I don't know how much to believe. Can it really be true that Dumbledore... Harry turns a little over. Harry! Uh, there's no more. Uh, into her second floor landing, Harry steps out, finds Hermione, dashing up the stairs, seeing him, she exhales in relief, calls out. Ron, I found him! Good! Tell him he, from me he's a git! Harry, you can't just disappear, we thought. He stops as Harry hands her, her, her the letter, she reads. It's from your mom. It's a serious. Mathilda Bagshot? Yeah, they, they knew her. She wrote a history of magic, you know. Did she now? I'm thinking maybe we should go talk to her. She still lives in Godric's Hollow. I'm thinking maybe she could help us. Uh, Hermione looks up, regards Harry closely. Harry, I can't imagine why you'd want to go back there, but I don't think the Phil de Bagshot is going to know where Voldemort hit his horcruxes. Harry starts to respond, frowns. Hermione reaches out, touches his face lightly. Hi, I think you two better come down here. To their first floor morning, Ron peers out a curtain as Hermione and uh, Harry join him in the courtyard outside. Two dark figures stand near a tree, and they're still on the bench. The two clinging to the tree are Death Eaters for sure. Don't know about the blog on the bench. Can't see us, of course, but we'll have to be careful coming and going. Come on, there's something else you need to see. Into a corridor, Regulus's room, morning. Harry and Hermione trail Ron to a narrow doorway beyond his trampled bedroom walls covered with eerie scrawlings and symbols of dark magic. Lovely. Ron pulls the door shut. Affixed to the outside is a small sign hand-lettered in a spidery crawl. Do not enter without the regress permission of Regulus Arturus Black. Regulus Arturus Black? Hermione gasps. Ron nods, extends his hand, and taps the first letter of each name on the sign. R-A-B. Interior kitchen, close on the lock at morning, as Harry moves the notes. To the Dark Lord, I know I will be dead long before you read this. I have stolen the real Horcrux and intend to destroy it. I be with Sirius's brother. We see the trio from this strange little P uh, POV again, sitting around the kitchen table, sloppy stacks of old daily prophets around them. Yes. Question is, did he actually destroy the real Horcrux? Harry nods, his boss is shouted something on the wall, just outside the kitchen. He scrambles up and out of sight. Stop, I order you. Seconds later, Harry reappears, dragging Creature, the house elf, by one ear. Creature mumbles foul oaths. Creature. Been spying on us, have you? Creature has been watching. Creature always watches. Maybe he knows. Harry glances at her, realizes what she means, takes a locket and dangles it before Creature's massive eyes like kitten. Hypnotist. Creature watches it sway back and forth. Ever seen this before? Creature grumbles incor incoherently. Creature, I own this place. Sirius left it to me, which means I own you too. Creature grimaces mightily and gives in. That was Master Regulus's locket. That's right, but there were two, weren't there? Weren't there? Creature's eyes widen in surprise. He nods again. Where's the other one? Creature doesn't know where the other locket is. Or was it here? Did you ever see it? He spins, his face ugly and vicious. Filthy mud blood. The Death Eaters will soon be coming for you. Ron snatches Creature by the neck, shakes him. Blood, Toledo, Weasley. Ron! Ron! Reluctantly, Ron releases the elf. Answer her. Yes, it was here, in this house, a most evil object. How do you mean? Before he died, Master Regulus ordered Kretcher to destroy it. It was the last thing he asked of Kretcher. But no matter how Kretcher tried, he could not. Where is it now? Did someone take it, Kretcher? It came in the night. He took many things including the locket. 
Who, Kretcher? Who was it? Mundungus. Mundungus Fletcher. Your glance up another, and Harry turns back to Creature, finds, looks him in the eye. Find him. Crack. Creature vanishes. Begin montage. If your Ministry of Magic, it's actually in day. But Pius Tikkanis, the new Minister uh, for Magic, stands just where his predecessor did, addressing his employees. In the background, we see Yaxley again and Dolores Umbridge. As your new Minister for Magic, I promise to restore this Temple of Tolerance to its former glory. Therefore, beginning today, each employee will be required to submit themselves for evaluation. But know this, you have nothing to fear, as long as you have nothing to hide. A signet smiles, a gang of dark wizard snatchers emerge into the axiom, pushing a bloody man before them. The crowd scares them easily, and we, uh, in the axiom afternoon, watch a flurry of leaflets flutter from the sky and land in a neat pile next to a stack of daily profits. Instantly, the newspaper board begins to insert the leaflets into the paper. Each leaflet is imprinted with Harry's face and then emblazoned with undesirable number one. Exterior countryside dust. Hogwarts Express stands still upon the cracks as dark wizards board the train. Interior Hogwarts Express, same time, dust. Dark wizards move down the aisle, flinging open cabin doors in search of Harry. They pass Ginny and Seamus, Katie Bell, Lavender, Romilda Vane, and Cormac. My father will hear about this. Great goes line. Finally, Neville bars her way, smiles defiantly. It's not Harry, you fools. Interior Granger House parlor. Dark wizards smash through the front door, enter the parlor. The part photographs still sit upon the mantel, showing only Hermione's parents, a tea they'd been drinking, still sitting on the table, dried up but unwashed. Exterior Diagon Alley dust, close to the Perry Pattern Alley, and Wall Street's post, trembling in a bitter wind. In the shadows, Monogus Fletcher concludes a transaction with a desperate looking witch and begins to count his money with a cruel smile. Seconds later, a snatch of squad appears and he withdraws into an alley into the safety of darkness when suddenly a loud crack his head and montage ends. Interior grunt, small place night. Dark figures continue to loom in the square. Interior drawing room, same time, Maul fiddles with the radio, which whistles eerily as he attempts to find a signal. Harry lies on the side, setting the snitch in his palm, and wings flapping slowly. They have flesh memories. Harry turns, sees that Hermione is eyeing the snitch. Snitches. Though never touched by bare skin until the seeker captures it. Even the wizard who fabricates it wears gloves. That way, if there's a dispute, the snitch can identify who first touched it. You mean it remembers me? When Scrimmagor first gave it to you, I thought it might open at your touch. That Dumbledore had hidden something in it. Harry ponders this, eyeing the wings flapping slowly, then crack, the sound echoes down the hall. Interior kitchen night, Harry and Hermione race into the kitchen. Crazy shadows spill from the door and pots crash. Suddenly, a tiny figure, wet and rag, tumbles into view, bangs from the wall up and scrambles up. As he starts back for the kitchen, he stops, sees Harry, smiles. Dobby! Harry Potter! So long it's been! Just in a hand, Creature reaches out, grabs Dobby by the neck, and pulls him away. Interior kitchen, same time. Creature, Dobby, and Mundungus Fletcher tumble from one side of the kitchen to the other. As they fly apart, Mundungus rolls his feet, dripping wet, wand flashing. Expelliarmus! Mundungus' wand soars into the air into Hermione's hand. As requested, Kretch has returned with the thief Mundungus Fletcher. Dobby has also returned with the thief Mundungus Fletcher. What are you playing at? Sitting up here bleeding our ourselves on me. Dobby was only trying to help. Dobby saw Creech in Diagon Alley, which Dobby thought was curious. And then Dobby heard Creature mention Harry Potter's name which Dobby thought was very curious. And then Dobby, Dobby saw that creature was talking to the thief, Mundungus Fletcher, which Dobby thought was very, very... I'm no curious. thief, you foul little kids. I'm a pervy of rare and wondrous objects. You're a thief, Dung. Everyone knows it. Everyone turns while stands in the doorway. Dobby smiles. Master Weasley, so good to see you again. Ron nods, eyes of bright red shoes on Dobby's feet. Wicked trainers. Listen, I prank that night, all right? I know I've wanted to die for you, mate. Can I help it if Mad Eye fell off his broom? Stop lying! Hermione begins to move toward Madungus. Ron reaches out, taking, takes her by the shoulders, eyes Madungus warningly. Piece of advice? Let's not rehash old times. Got it, mate? When you turn this place over, don't deny it. You found a locket, am I right? Why, was it valuable? You've still got it. 
No, he's worried he should have got more money for it. It wouldn't be difficult, wouldn't it? We didn't give it away, did I? Yeah, I was pitching me wares in Diagon Alley when some ministry hag comes up and ha asks me to see my license. Says she's of a mind to lock me up and would have too. She hadn't taken a fancy to that locket. Who was she, this witch? Well, she's right there, isn't she? Bleeding bow and all. He points to a yellow, yellow prophet on top of a nearby stack where a squat woman with the face of a toad blinks from the front page, Dolores Umbridge. Exterior of Whitehall Street, an empty street corner, then Ron peers around a building a few yards off of which my father Hopkirk approaches. Ron begins to walk, preceding her down the street, and kneels fiddling with his shoelace. Zap! The witch stiffens and falls into the arms of Harry. Ron hurries back, takes her feet, and the storage area, Harry helps Harry hustle her out of beauty, pop her up between two wizards, one tall, one short, both unconscious. Hermione is pouring apologies potion into three cups. Right, so let's do it. Who gets who? Well, unless one of you fancies wearing a skirt. Hermione leans down, plucks a hair from the witch. Ron frowns it as he surveys the two remaining wizards. Remember what we said. Keep your eyes down. Don't speak to anyone unless absolutely necessary. Act as normal as possible. Just do what you see everyone else doing. We do that, and with a bit of luck, we get ourselves inside. And then... It gets really tricky. Correct. Harry and Hermione look one more at the stunned trio before them. This is completely mental. Completely, utterly, without question. The world's mental. Come on, drink up. We got a Horcrux to find. Zero Whitehall Street morning. The trio in their new ident identities emerge. Ron, in the, in the guise of Red Cattermole, takes out an ID card. In case you're interested, I'm Red Cattermole, Magical Maintenance Department. Mathalda Hop Crick, assistant in the improper use of magic office. I'm nobody. Just somebody. Be careful. Just then a skinny wizard strides by. Morning, Reg. Good luck today. Oh, yeah, thanks. Wrong glasses to Harry and Hermione, jerks his head toward the skinny wizard and they follow. That's, uh, the Public toilet, skinny wizard drops down the stairs into a public toilet to trio up here. What do you reckon he meant by good luck? Interior gentlemen's toilet morning. Harry and Ron enter, glance around, and seeing as everyone else is doing so, slip into cubicles. Interior the cubicle, Harry enters, flushing sounds all around. He looks to his left, sees a pair of booted feet climbing to the next toilet, and looks into his right, sees Ron as Greg Caramel peering in. We flush ourselves in? Apparently so. That's bloody disgusting. As Reg Ron's face disappears, Harry steps up onto his toilet, dips his shoe in gingerly, then withdraws it, completely dry. Stepping in fully, he reaches up, pulls the chain, and instantly sucked down. Seconds later, in the Ministry of Magic, he comes shooting out of a fireplace into the grand atrium of the Ministry of Magic. He sees Hermione's already arrived and standing before a massive statue of black stone, depicting a witch and wizard sitting upon hundreds of naked bodies, twisting in pain. Harry joins her. Are those... Muggles in their rightful place. Harry glanced at the base of the statue where the words magic is might are engraved. Just then, a balding wizard bumps into Harry. Move it, will you? Oh, run, Quan. Forgive me. Balding wizard hurries away, clearly frightened as does another wizard merely at the sight of Harry. You appear to be quite popular. Ron approaches, running a gauntlet of pitying looks from the co workers who echo the skinny wizard's good luck. I gotta tell you, I'm starting to freak out a bit. Is in a gang of young, rough looking wizards led by the leader, Scabior, enter the atrium, pushing along a small group of captives. The ministry must be hiring young young these days. They're not ministry, they're snatchers. They hunt muggle bones and blood traders for a price. How long did you say this batch of polo juice potion would last, Hermione? I didn't. Cats on wall. The all jump. Yaxi strides directly up to Ron. It's still raining in my office. Two days now. Really? Uh, have you tried an umbrella? He actually eyes Ron curiously, then leans forward menacingly. You do realize I'm on my way downstairs, don't you, Catamol? Downstairs? To interrogate your wife. If my wife's blood... 
were in doubt and the head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement needed a job doing, I think I'd make it a priority. You've got one hour. Just in the lift behind him, clangs open. Hermione tugs Ron inside. He actually turns and storms off just as the doors close. Oh my god, what am I going to do? My wife's all alone downstairs. Ron, you don't have a wife. Oh, right. Look, we'll go with you. No, that's mad. You two find Umbridge. I'll be fine. But how do I stop it raining? Try finite incantatum. Of course, if something has gone wrong with an atmospheric charm. Level two, Department of Magical Enforcement, including the Wisengamut Administration Services, Arbor Headquarters, and Improper Use of Magic Department. This is you. Interior exterior lift. Level two continuous action warning. The lift opens and Ron begins to back out. Finite incantatum. Okay. And if that doesn't work? But before she can respond, the golden grills of the lift close and she and Harry are swept away. I don't like him being on his own down there. Ron's been coming here since he, he was two years old. It's us. It's us you should be worrying about. Really have horrible teeth. You know that? Level one, Minister of Magic and Support Staff. I say if we don't locate Umbridge within the hour, we go, we go find Ron and come another day. Deal? The girls clang open again and Harry Hermione freeze. And turn to the left, standing next to a long-haired wizard, her neck unwrapped into a fuzzy pink scarf is Dolores Umbridge. She looks up from the clipboard in her hand and sees Hermione. Oh, Mathilda. Uh, Travis sent you, did he? Good. We'll go straight down. Albert, aren't you getting out? Harry nods neatly, steps out as the lift descends. He watches Harry, Hermione's anxious face sink out of sight. Interior Ministry of Magic, level one. Harry passes one gleaming door after another, glancing down purple catter corridors that stretch to nothingness. A muttering wizard passes by, murmuring a quail flowing in front of him. Otherwise, it is eerily quiet. Weasley! Harry stops and peers around the corner and sees a slight, familiar-looking red-headed wizard, Percy Weasley. They're waiting for your report downstairs. Oh, yes, of course. Harry watches Percy hurry off. Interior corridor, morning moments later. Harry moves on, hears voices ahead, emerges into a, wild, a wide open space and discovers dozens of witches and wizards sitting at sea a small desk, waving their wands in unison. Squares of pink paper flit like kites through the air, dropping into neat stacks. Harry creeps closer, sees that there are pamphlets entitled Mudbloods and the danger they pose to a peaceful, pure blood society. Morning. Oh. Reckon the old hag will be interrogating Mudbloods all day. Shh, careful. Pius Tigganese appears, trailing a, a retinue of lackeys. Run, calm. Harry returns uh, Tigganese's uh, nod, watches him pass from view. As his gaze shifts, he finds the red-haired witch regarding him with fear. She looks quickly away, resumes her work at, at double time. Harry's eyes shift again, regarding a shining mahogany door across the way. He squints. Something is embedded within the door. He crosses the room, stops dead. Fitted into the wood is an eye. It spins weakly and stops. Mad Eye's eye. He looks down to a brass nameplate next to the door. Dolores Umbridge, head of the Muggle-born Registration Commission. Harry's jaw tightens in anger and he glances over his shoulder, sees the red-haired witch watching him. She glances away quickly. Harry reaches into an inner pocket and removes a decoy detonator, an odd object with little weaving legs and a rubber bulbed horn for a body. He releases it. He sculls down his body across the floor and directly into the sea of desk. Harry waits, then bang, black smoke billows into the air and pink pages fly everywhere and the detonator gives birth to dozens of tiny replicants of itself, which race about the floor, up the legs, and across the desk of the pamphleteers. Then red-haired witch shrieks, others follow, and Harry uh, slips into Umbridge's office, uh, closes the door, the room's decor is sickeningly cute. Uh, lace dollies, dry flowers, Harry takes out his wand. Accio Locket. Nothing. Harry frowns, glances about, a leaflet bearing his face, undesirable number one, lies upon Umbridge's desk, along with photographs of other order members. Two have a large pink X scratched on them, scratch on them, Dumbledore and Mad-Eye. Harry begins to search the office, opening drawers, rippling through filing cabinets, and stops. 
pulls out a file inside a photograph of Hermione in, in an accompanying data sheet. Blood status, muggle board, whereabouts, last seen in the company of an undesirable number one. Quickly, Harry places the file and searches out Ron's. Blood status, pure blood, pro muggle leading. Whereabouts, last seen in the company of undesirable number one. Harry starts to put the file away, then pauses, looks closer. Bob or Offer Weasley, ministry employee, status, track. Strong likelihood undesirable number one will contact. Harry says the word track, then. All right, all right. Let's calm down, shall we? Harry replaces the file, steps to the door, and peers through. Slowly, he eases open the door, back out, and Interior Ministry of Magic Level 1 turns uh, the red-haired witch is watching him. He puts his finger to his lips. Her eyes go wide as saucers. It probably just snuck up here from experimental charms. I think none of us will soon forget last month's poisonous duck. Seeing the red-haired witch's expression, the balding wizard turn, turns and as before Woodward's at the side of Harry. Duncorn? Harry gives him an appraising look, turns the corner, and dashes off. Uh, interior level one outside lifts. Harry springs into view, just as the same muttering wizard trails his quill um, out of an empty lift. Uh, interior lift morning. Harry races inside, hits a button, watches the grills close. He glances at his reflection in the mirrored wall, bears his teeth. Hermione's right. They're awful. Just then, the grills clang open, and Ron enters, soaking wet and wild eyed. Morning. Ron, it's me. Harry! Blimey, I forgot what you looked like. Where's Hermione? She went down to the courtrooms with Umbridge. The, gr the grails open it again and reveal Arthur Weasley in the company of an elderly witch, Wakinda. I understand, Wakinda, but I can't be a party to that. Arthur stops, then seeing Harry and regards him with utter disdain, then turns his eyes to Ron and softens. Hello, Reg. Is it Marion for questioning today? Try to have faith. If there's anything Molly and I can do for you. Arthur pats Ron's shoulder, stops, pulls his dripping hand away. Let me guess, it's raining and yaks these offers again. Tell him to try in an umbrella. Arthur looks into exit. As they go, Ron cranes his neck, watching with a look of long longing as the grills begin to close. Suddenly, Harry reaches out, blocks doors. Arthur, you know you're being tracked, don't you? Is that, a, is that a threat, Runcon? No, Arthur. It's a fact. They're watching you. Arthur eyes Harry with a mixture of suspicion and confusion, and perhaps recognition. Harry moves his hand, then grills closed. Ron stares at him. I'll tell you later. Let's find Hermione. Interior patches way morning. Uh, Harry and Ron move down a dark porch like stone patches way as they move further along their breath come, becomes visible and Ron silk into the bones begins to tumble. Bloody cold down here. Then they see swirling outside the courtroom doors like sentinels are tall black hooded figures, the mentors. Just then a man comes stumbling out of the courtroom in the company of a pair of death eaters. I'm half Lord, I tell you. My father was a wizard. Look him up. William Alderton. He worked here for 30 years. As Ron watches a terrified man pass, Harry grabs his arm, pulls him toward the courtroom. Uh, interior courtroom, same time. A dark cathedral possessed of a palpable chill. The mentors float eerily in the gloom. The ceiling stretches high, disappears in darkness. As Harry and Ron enter and notice at first, they move cautiously, taking in their, in their surroundings. Hermione comes to view, sitting on a stack of parchment behind a balcony of alongside Umbridge and Yaxley, while a bright silver uh, cat Umbridge's Patronus piles up and down, providing warmth to them, and them only. Harry's eyes track the cat, then drift to Umbridge herself. Suddenly, he falters. Ron notices, eyes him curiously, whispers. What is it? The corner of Harry's eyes contracts, his head slightly cocked as if he could sense the presence of something. It's here. As Ron reacts, deciphering Harry's words, a woman's voice uh, comes their way. Reg? Ron turns, low to balustrade, a frail woman, Mary Cattermole, Catter sits alone, rich cane, seeing Ron, her, her, her uh, wan face brightens. Uh, Ron glances at Harry, who nods, urging him on. Ron moves to the center of the room, taking his place behind a woman. Hesitating, he places his hand gently upon her shoulders and glances up, seeing Hermione watching him. Mary Elizabeth Cattermole. Yes. Mother to Maisie, Ellie, and Alfred, wife to Reginald. Mary looks up to Ron, her eyes glistening with fear. 
uh, he smiles reassuringly. He looks away, replies. Yes. Harry eyes on Bridge. She has draped a pink scarf over her chair, revealing a gold chain that extends from her neck down to the ruffled folds of her blouse. A slight humming, faint, and oddly lyrical rings in Harry's ears as he studies the chain as if drawn forward by some irresistible force. He begins to drift toward the balustrade. A wand was taken from you upon your arrival today at the ministry, uh, Mrs. Cattermold. Is this that wand? Umbridge displays a cherry wood wand. Mary Cattermold nods. Would you please uh, tell the court from which witch or wizard you took this wand? But I didn't take it. I got it from Diagon Alley at Outlanders when I was 11. It chose me. Umbridge leans forward, teeth glittering as the cat stings by and briefly illuminates her face. And the chain her neck trembles like a snake, something heavy swinging forward and dangling over the void, the locket. Ron stares at his dumbstruck, her mind catches her breath. Harry, fully removed from the shadow, now stands fully in view, the corners of his eyes staring once again, the hum growing louder in his ears. Slowly, he reaches into his pocket. No, no, I don't think so, Mrs. Cattermole. Wands only choose witches, and you are not a witch. But I am. Tell them, Reg. Tell them what I am. Ron starts to speak, but Umbridge's gaze has shifted to Harry, to, to the wand rising in his hand and pointing at her. What the devil are you doing, Albert? As Harry speaks, his own face ripples through run corners, the apologies portion wearing off. You're lying, and one mustn't tell lies, Dolores. Stupefy. A flash of red light hits Umbridge, and she slumps forehead, striking the ball straight. Instantly, the silver cat vanishes. He actually draws his wand, uh, but Ron is too quick and takes him out with a single blast. Hermione strips the locket from Umbridge's neck and leaps down instantly. Her breath comes and plums as the Dementors drift forward. Expecto Patronum. A silver stack soars from the tip of Harry's wand, circling the room as it drives the Dementors back. Bellatio. The chains encircling Mary Caramel's wrists drop like dead snakes as she stands. She eyes Harry in amazement as he transforms back into himself. You. Um, oh, sorry. You. Oh. It's you, Reg. It's Harry Potter. Yes, isn't it? This will be one to tell the kids. Interior Ministry of Magic actually in the morning, as a trio along with Mary Cattermole pelts into the atrium and races toward the fireplace. Harry bumps to the muttering wizard who spins, takes a look at Harry and blinks. Harry Potter. Harry Potter! Another wizard hears, looks down, repeats the same. Harry's name spreading like wildfire in a gloomy hush. Hermione glances about nervously, and she does, begins to transform back into herself. Harry, they've seen you. We've got to get out of here. Harry nods, quickens his pace, Ron glances about, then turns facing Mary as he continues to walk backwards. Mary, go home. Get the kids. I'll, I'll meet you there. We have to get out of the country. Understand? Mary shakes her head, confused. Mary, do as I say. Mary stops, a bit teary-eyed, not, not dutifully. Ron frowns. I'm sorry, it's just... Mary Caramel takes him by the collar, pulls him to a deep kiss. Her, Harry and Marty glance back and watch as Ron transforms during the kiss back to himself. Mary! All eyes turn. The real red Cattermole stands robless outside one of the fireplaces. She looks up at Ron, now transforming, jumps back. Long story. Nice meeting you. He, he gives her a peck, races off. He, he's halfway to his fireplace when he spies Percy. He swallows and stops altogether, and they stare wordless at one another. Finally, Percy begins to open his mouth. Piss off. Yaxley staggers into the atrium. Seal the exits now! Harry, Ron, and Hermione glance at each other, break for the fireplace as Yaxi fires on them. One fireplace after another seals itself. As they reach the last open grate, they pitch themselves as one onto the polished marble floor, spells scaling over their heads and go sliding inside. As they fall into darkness, Harry glances back and watches Yaxi pitch himself into the void, just like before a solid block of granite drops like a guillotine, sealing the fireplace and plunging Yaxi and the trio into total darkness. A whirlwind tosses the trio as flashes of light reveal each briefly including Yaxi, who reaches out for Hermione's robe. The door of Brimall Place rushes forward. The eyes of the serpent knots are flashing. Then there's a burst of purple light, a torture scream, and uh, exterior forest day. Moments later, the world spins as Harry lies on the back of on a bed of a, leaves and twigs. Above, sunlight streams through a canopy of trees. Wincing, Harry rises on his elbow, sees a locket lying in the dirt. He scrabbles up, scoops it into his fingers, and grins. Harry, quickly, in my bag, there's a small bottle labeled Essence of Disney. Harry turns, sees Hermione bent over Ron's twitching body. Quickly! Harry blinks, stumbles 
uh, dizzily into the bag as he reaches in, objects present themselves in furious succession. Accio Deatin. Did it. A, a small brown bottle lands in his palm. Unstopper it. Hermione rips open Ron's shirt, which is soaked in blood. The flesh of his upper arm is flayed as if someone had scooped a portion away. Hermione, his arm. Just do it! Harry does so, hands her the bottle. She sprinkles three drops onto Ron's bleeding wound. Greenish smoke billows. What happened? I, I thought we were going back to Grimwald Place. We were. We were there. But Yaxley had hold of me. I knew we couldn't stay once he'd seen, so when he let go, I brought us here. Ron got splinched. I, I'm sorry. Don't be stupid. Smoke sifts, clear as Ron's wound no longer bleeds. It's all I feel safe doing. Hermione rises, takes out her wand, and begins to walk in a wide circle, muttering, Salvio Hexia, Protego Totalum. What are you doing? Protective enchantments. I don't fancy another visit like we had on uh, Shaftesbury Avenue, do you? Especially with Ron like this. You can get going on the tent. Tent? What am I supposed to find? He stops, glances down in her bag, then back to Hermione. Repello Mugolotum. Muflato. Exterior forest, night, can glows from within under a starlit sky. Interior tent, same time. Hermione pours tea from a kettle into cups. How are the mushrooms? Seem to be the only edible things growing around here. Harry grimaces as he chews. Edible is clearly debatable. They're great. Make sure to leave some for Ron. No problem. Harry sets his plate aside. Um, plucks up the locket, dangles it in the firelight, glances at Ron. How bad is he? He'll be all right in a few days, hopefully. If we could take him to Hogwarts to Madame Pomfrey. Her glasses stops her, confirming what she knows. So, where do we go next? Dumbledore had a theory. He felt that a Horcrux would not be made out of random objects, and he felt they wouldn't be hidden randomly either. We know of the three so far. The ring, which according to Dumbledore belonged to Tom, Riddle's gr um, grandfather. The diary, which belonged to Tom himself. And this, which again, according to Dumbledore, belongs to his mother. Hermione eyes a locket as it glimmers in the firelight. Guessing a bit that thinking it's a piece of Voldemort. Don't, don't say it. No. Harry and Hermione turn, see Ron staring. It's taboo. You know whose name. That's how they track people now. That's how they found us in the cafe that night. How do you know? I overheard a bloke from the enforcement office talking about it at the ministry. Blimey, what's that smell? Dinner. Not bloody likely. It smells like gi something Ginny would cook. Tea? Ron nods, grimacing he pushes himself up, knows he's wearing a sling of Hermione's fashion. He looks from it to her as she tends the tea, a flicker of remorse playing over his face for his dinner remarks. Is that it? Harry nods, has him in the locket. Ron turns it over in his hand, frowns. It's Harry who nods. I know, I felt it too. It's, it's like it's ticking or something. Like, it has a tiny metal heart. Like, it's... Alive. Harry nods. Hermione eyes it coldly. I hate it. It's like he's here with us. That's why we're going to kill it. Sarah Force, close on locket. Uh, lying upon a tree stump, Ron leans against a tree, looking pale. Hermione nods to Harry. He releases his wand. He raises his wand. Descendium. The locket's been swiftly in place, but remains whole. Incendio. Flames engulf the locket as its metal flesh turns scarlet, but, the, but then the flames die. Expluso. The tree stump explodes, but the locket remains unmarked. Confringio. Round beneath the stump craters, but the locket remains untouched. Hermione lowers her wand, but Harry continues on firing a succession of spells, looking almost possessed. Hermione studies him oddly until finally he stops. All goes silent, except for the leaves shifting in the wind above. Then, slowly, another sound comes from the clear, a ticking, coming from the locket. It's angry. Hermione shivers. Harry steps forward, kneels down, and takes the locket by his chain. It ticks. He slings it over his neck. Rises. What are you doing? We have to keep it safe until we can figure out how to destroy it. I can put it in my bag. No. Seems strange, mate. Dumbledore sends you off to find a load of Horcruxes, but doesn't bother to tell you how to destroy them. Doesn't that bother you? Harry studies the locket, which is ticking and slowed, then walks off. Hermione eyes Ron, who returns the glance, then pushes away from the tree and walks off slowly in the opposite direction. 
and tear a tent dust. Ron lies on his pot, filling with the radio. Voices surface in the static briefly, then fade. Um, Tyr and Catman, at the same time. Uh, Harry turns the mirror shard over in his fingers, fingers, then eyes Hermione collecting flowers in the distance. He looks beautiful, seeing him. She smiles, waves, moves on. The radio spits static, and he tilts the mirror so he can see Ron. He looks annoyed, but pulls his tongue and slips the mirror in his pocket. Noticing the locket, he slips it from his shirt, studies the little fissures in the locket's metal skin. Suddenly, he winces. The locket spills from his palm, dances upon the chain. The skin, constricting the scar, constricts. Tell me, Grigorovich. Tell me where it is. Here, one shot back to the room. Old, an old man, Grigorovich, with pure white hair and a bushy beard, towers in the dark corner. I told you, I no longer have it. It was stolen from him many years ago. You wouldn't be lying, would you, Grigorovich? Because I must tell you, that will only make it worse for you. As a bony hand, Voldemort extends the wand, Gorovitch re reacts with fear, and we rush him, dripping through the dilating people into a uh, flashback into a dark corridor. Years pass, a hall of shadows, a younger Gorovitch hurries toward a distant room, a lantern bobbing in his head. I speak the truth. I remember it like it was yesterday. Interior workshop, completing his action, Gorovitch bursts inside, lantern swaying, wood shavings littered the floor. Mm -hmm. On the window ledge, uh, perched like a giant bird, a young man, Grindelwald, with golden hair, grins devilishly. And raises one, a blast of light bleaches the screen, and we cut to the interior wand shot back to him. Gorovich's face stricken with terror as Voldemort's wand tip lays with light. Who was he? The thief. Just a boy, not of the village. It was he who took it. I never see it again, I swear on my life. I believe you. A burst of blue light engulfs the room, and to tent dust, uh, Harry's eyes flutter open. He sees Hermione, beautiful in the amber dust, standing in a bit away. Studying him. I thought it should stopped. Harry looks at her, shakes his head. You can't let him in, Harry. Dumbledore himself said it. You have to close your mind. It's too dangerous. It's not a candle I can blow out, Hermione. It always burns, even if it just, even if it's just a flicker. Can you understand that? Harry's eyes are and looks away. She frowns, concerned by this. Then, tell me, what you saw? He's found him. Volt. He stops, glancing back toward the tent, toward Ron. You know who. He's found Gregovich. The wand maker? Yes. How'd you know? Victor got his wand from Gre Gre Gregorovich. Most Durmstrang students did at one time. What's he got to do with you know who? You know who wants something Gregorovich once had. Don't know what, but he's desperate to have it. It has as if his life depends on it. Hermione studies Harry. The radio squawks from inside the tent. Harry's eyes flare. He starts to speak. Don't. It comforts him. Well, it sets my teeth on, a on edge. What's he expecting to hear? Good news? I think he just hopes he doesn't hear bad news. It gets him through the day. And what gets you through the day? We've all made sacrifices, Harry. Harry eyes her expression lessly, nods toward the tent. How long before he can travel? I don't know. It takes time. I'm doing all I can. You're not doing enough. Hermione sees Harry's angry profile then. Take it off. Harry turns, sees Hermione sitting closely. She points toward her throat, toward the locket. Take it off. Now. Harry slips the locket off. Reacts. Better? Loads. Hermione takes the locket, cradles it in her fingers. It's cold, even though it's been lying against your skin for days. Hermione sees Harry studying the locket, troubled. We'll take turns, okay? Hermione slips it over her neck. She frowns briefly, sensing its presence. Then looks up at Harry, who studies her, then nods. And she her tent night. Ron sleeps beside a crackling radio. Harry lies a few feet away, away awake. And she her tent at the same time. Hermione huddles outside in the frigid darkness, trembling. Her eyes break the trees. Deep within there is, for the briefest of inst instances, movement, or so it seems. She squints, sees nothing, but turns her chin to her chest as she does. Something carries on the air, laughter, and the cackle of boys, or so it seems. Her chin rises. This, she looks again into the trees. And to her at the same time, Harry reaches out, starts to turn the radio off when... Severus Snape, newly appointed headmaster of Hogwarts. As signal fades, Harry rolls onto his side and twists the dial behind him. Uh, we see Hermione's shadow rise, move away from the tent. 
Um, and Sierra Catman, same time, her body moves towards the trees, interior tent, same time, as the radio system fading in and out. Harry grabs his rucksack, pulls out the Winkle Mar Marauders map. There is little resemblance to the school under Dumbledore's leadership. Snape's curriculum is severe, reflecting the wishes of the Dark Lord and infractions are dealt with harshly by the two Death Eaters on the staff. Harry appears at the map before him and sure enough discovers Snape's name drifting about Dumbledore's office. It's near a tree, same time. Hermione moves deeper into the trees and stops. Shadows splinter in the, amid the tiring trucks and voices come clear, standing utterly still. Hermione watches as the gang of snatchers make their way in her direction. They look unwashed and feral as they've been in the wild for some time. As they pass between feet of her, but unable to see her, only Hermione's eyes track their passage. As before, Scabior leads the way, Frenera gray back at his side. Abruptly, Scabior stops, eyes narrow. What's that? That smell. He utters glance about dumbly. Scabior retraces his steps until he stands directly in front of Hermione, his eyes looking right through her. He leans forward, ever so slightly, only inches from her neck, nostrils flaring. The locket ticks, trembling upon Hermione's breastbone. And slowly, Scabrier pulls back, eyes probing the darkness, before withdrawing. Leaning the others away, the last pair drag what pair to be bodies. As they vanish within the trees, Hermione follows and finally swallows. Snatchers. She spins, finds Harry standing a few feet off. Good to know your enhancements work. Smell it. My perfume. Your tent, same time. Ron pushes past the front, piercing the darkness. In the distance, he sees Harry and Hermione standing close. Exterior tree, same time. Hermione hugs herself, shivers. We have to leave. We're not safe here. I told you, Ron's not strong enough to apparate. Then we'll go. Then we'll go by foot. Zero farm day. We pan down from the sky, find horizon. Three figures approach in the distance. Harry, Hermione, Ron, bold and faintly, so faint. It can barely be heard at first. The soft whistling sound rises on the breeze. We pan back up. Slowly, one by one, dots perforate the blue. The whistling sound builds. Harry stops listening and returns. Hermione, trailing a few feet behind him, stops eyeing questioningly. We wrap focus over her shoulder, watch the dots attenuate, take the shapes of plumes. Zero Farm Barn, day. The whistling is ear splitting now. More of a war as the trio scraper into a listing barn and they shut the doors. As they peer upward to the skeletal remains of the hayloft, their faces flash with light. They see a succession of deck eaters strike the blue above. The rotting timber buzzes, and bats stands crazily in the loft above. Gradually, the sound recedes. The bats settle. Uh, exterior, rolling landscape day, an epic flyover. Three small figures move slowly below. One figure, Ron, trails the other two, Harry and Hermione, to cut down to ground level to Ron. He glances about, suddenly staring at the forsaken landscape, and looks ahead to Harry and Hermione. The sight of them, walking side by side, does nothing to approve his mood. I'm hungry. Harry and Hermione stop, turn, study him for a moment. What? I'm hungry. Hermione glances at Harry. He continues to stare at Ron as if taking a measure of him. We're all hungry. Ron returns Harry's glance and looks off again. Hermione crosses to Ron. Examines his ragged bandage. Leave it. Hermione glanced at Ron's profile and briefly at the four cracks standing from his neck, ignoring his words. She begins to rummage her beaded bag. Mom can make food appear out of thin air. No one can conjure food out of thin air. Food is the first of the five principal ex exemptions of Gam's law. The other four. Oh, are speak English, can't you? As Ron jerks his injured arm away, Hermione looks up and meets Ron's hard gaze. I said. Leave it. Hermione glances at the bandage in her hand, puts it away. It'll be dark soon. We need to find a place to sleep. Good plan. Yeah, brilliant. Only, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't that yesterday's plan? And the day before that? And the day before that? Walk, sleep, walk, sleep. Harry stares at Ron and begins to walk for him. Hermione watches silently. Ron stands utterly still. When Harry stops, he simply knocks Ron's neck. My turn. As he reaches out, Ron blocks his hand for a moment. They simply stand silently. Then Ron strips the chain from his neck and hands it to Harry and brushes past him. Harry glances at Hermione, drapes the four crux over his head and follows. Hermione watches him go and does the same. It's your encampment, cooling towers. Uh, late afternoon, the light rain falls. Harry rain the locket now, walks the perimeter of the camp, glowers toward the tent in the distance. In the tent, safe, warm, and out of earshot, Hermione tends to Ron's arms and stares at Harry. 
He doesn't know what he's doing, does he? A frown creases from Ayn's forehead as she studies Ron, gives a glance at Harry, a trace of doubt in her eyes. None of this do. Steer Valley Day, three figures move through a blood uh, red animal landscape. Steer abandoned Caravan Park, the charred husk of several RVs, halting black masses lay about the ash green park. Ron, trailed by her Harry and Hermione, pauses. His eyes scan the scorched earth fixed on the blackened swing. Swaying back and forth in a tiny playground, his eyes shift the ground and he crashes. His fingers shift the dirt, dry dirt, to reveal a shiny toy, not of muggle making. What is this over here? I don't like this place. Harry and Ron both turn and look at her. I want to go. It's your clearing day. Ron's face fills the screen, unwashed and wild. He looks towards something unseen. Then a rabbit pops into view, nose probing some brush. When Ron raises the wand, points a fire wing, bam! Dirt explodes near the rabbit's rump and gives it off and running. Seconds later, Harry appears, giving chase. Ron curses and pelts after. The rabbit zigzags through the trees, eluding one blast after another. As Harry and Ron trip through the forest, they begin laughing, their aim becoming more and more erratic. A tree limb explodes over Harry's head and he wheels, fires fatally back at Ron. They change a few more blasts and one narrowly misses Harry. Instinctively, eyes flaring, he wheels, fires back at Ron, narrowly misses him. They both stop, stare at one another, chest heaving, their breath drifting in plumes, smiles gone. Ron rubs his injured arm, almost still now, and turns away. Here at the same time, close on a soothing can of mushrooms. Uh, in the shadows, Ron lies on his back, staring gloomily at the pitch ceiling of the tent, listening to the radio's murmur, while Hermione, wearing a red scarf against the chill, runs the fingers of her left hand through Harry's hair, alternately employing the one in her right hand to trim Harry's hair and flip the pages of A History of Magic. Oh my god. What? I'll tell you in a minute. Harry watched his hair drip, dropping to the ground. Maybe you could tell me now. All right. The sort of Gryffindor. It's goblin made. Brilliant. You don't understand. Dirt and rust have no effect on the blade. It only takes in that which makes it stronger. Okay. Harry, you already destroyed one Horcrux, right? Tom Riddle's diary in the Chamber of Secrets. With a basculus fang. If you tell... If you tell me you've got one of those in that bloody beaded bag of yours. Didn't you see, in the Chamber of Secrets, you stabbed the basilisk with the sword of Gryffindor. Its, a bla its blade is impregnated with basilisk, basilisk venom. It only, it only takes in that which makes it stronger. Exactly, which means... It can't destroy Horcruxes. Which is why Dumbledore left it to you in his will. You're brilliant, Hermione, truly. Actually, I'm highly logical, which allows me to look past the extraneous detail and perceive clearly that which others have looked. There's only one problem. Suddenly the lights click off. The sword was stolen. Lights click back on. Hermione and Harry turn to see Ron, the illuminator in hand, lying in the shadows of his bunk, staring at the roof as, as the first drops of rain hit the canvas above. Yeah, I'm still here, but you should carry on. Don't let me spoil your fun. Harry glances at Hermione, who's studying Ron warily. What's the problem? Problem? There's no problem. Not according to you, anyway. I would drop his and begin to pelt the canvas of the tent. Plunk, plunk, plunk. Look, don't be shy. If you got something to say, spit it out. Ron swings out of the bunk as his face meets the light. He looks mean, the locket chain glittering. All right, I'll spit it out. Don't expect me to skip up and down because there's some other damn thing we have got to find. Ron. I thought you knew what you signed up for. Yeah, I thought I did too. I don't understand what part of this, is, this isn't this is living up to your expectations. Do you think we'd be staying in a five-star hotel, finding a Horcrux every other day? Did you think you'd be back to Mummy by Christmas? No, I just reckoned after all this time, we'd have actually achieved something. I reckoned you knew what you were doing. I reckoned Dumbledore had told you something worthwhile. I reckoned you had a plan. I've told you everything Dumbledore told me, and in case you haven't noticed, we found... We found a Horcrux. Yeah, and we're about as near getting rid of it as we were for finding the rest of them, aren't we? Take it off, Ron. Please, take it off. You wouldn't be talking like this if you hadn't been wearing it all day. Yeah, he would. Do you ever think I haven't noticed the two of you whispering behind my back? Do you ever think I haven't guessed what you were thinking? Harry, we, we weren't. Don't lie. You said it too. You said you were disappointed. I didn't. Not like that. Harry, I didn't. Do you know why I listen to that radio every night? Do you? To make sure I don't hear Ginny's name, or Fred, or George, or Mums, or- 
You think I don't listen? You think I don't know what it is? It's like what it's like. No, you don't know what it's like. Your parents are dead. You have no family. Dead silence. Harry glares at Ron. Hermione looks shocked. Suddenly, they both rush forward and lock on each other's throats. Hermione rushes in. Stop! Stop! They let go. Step back. Harry points to Ron's neck. Go then, but believe that. Hermione's eyes flashing with panic. Glance from Harry to Ron. Ron strips the chain from his neck, passes it away, then turns to Hermione. And you? Me? Are you staying or coming? Hermione looks anguished, glancing from one to the other. The canvas screams would have rained behind her. Fine. I get it. I saw you two the other night. Yeah, that's right. Didn't know I knew, did you? What? Ron, no. Please. He looks inside the tent flap and the rain roars. As Hermione rushes after him, she tips over the radio. As it hisses, Harry glowers at the whole front. Seconds later, Hermione returns, sobbing hair plastered to her face. He's gone. Here, a riverbank morning. The river flows quietly, thick and muddy from the previous night's rain. Harry emerges from the tent, peers into the trees. Hermione stands far down by the riverbank, tying the red scarf to a tree. Here, a riverbank late morning. Hermione's eyes red from crying, clutches the beaded back in one hand while the locket dangles from the other. She uh, peers one last time toward the trees, then without turning, reaches out her hand. Harry studies her, and he steps forward, gently takes her fingers in his. Instantly, they disapparate, pitch into a whirlwind of darkness as they reappear. Exterior hillside. On a windswept hillside, their hands break free, and Hermione stumbles away, sobs, racking her body as she bears her face in her hands. Harry watches her, then turns away, takes out his wand, and begins to walk in a circle, casting enchantments in a soft voice. Salvio Hexia. Protego Totalum. Here at Hillside, Harry walks to the of the camp, looking up every so often to look at the illuminated tent. He watches Hermione's shadow pass within, sliding over the canvas. Seconds later, the radio cracks to life. He shakes his head, vaguely annoyed, and stop, starts to move off again when a song comes clear. He stops. Interior tent, he dusts. As Harry ducks into the tent, Hermione looks up. It's a muggle station. Hermione smiles, and Harry does too. Harry listens, then debating, reaches out his hand. Hermione eyes him, uncertainly, then allows him to pull her to her feet. He steps forward, gently, gently removes the locket from her neck, and tosses it to the ground. She looks at it, then back to him. He smiles, and not prompting, they begin to dance, tentatively at first, then letting themselves go. Exterior tent, same time, the shadows flicker upon the canvas like a joyous shadow puppet, moving when abandoned until abruptly the signal slips away, and in the tent, the static returns, the smiles fade, they stop. Moving, Hermione averts her eyes, exits. Harry watches her go. He takes the locket from the floor, flings it over his neck. Dear Hillside, Hermione, wrapped in a blanket, sits just outside the tent by a wind whipped fire, going back and forth between tales of Beetle the Bard and another book, Spellman's uh, Syllabary. And here at the same time, Harry lies on top of the bunk above Ron's empty lower, eyeing his face and the surface of the snitch sitting there. As he takes it in hand. The wings begin to flap slowly up and down. He watches it for a long time. An idea strikes. Folding his fingers around the orb, he brings it to his palm, whips briefly, then turns it over in his palm. The snitch's tired wings go still, and as if written by an invisible hand, words appear on the smooth golden surface. I open at the close. Hermione. Steer your hillside, continue a sec. Uh, Harry slips to the flap. Hands are the snitch. You're right. It's like you said, snitches have flesh memories, but I didn't catch my first snitch with my hand. I swallowed it. Hermione watched the words vanish on orb. I open at the close. What do you reckon it means? I don't know, but look, I found something as well. He turns the tails of the beetle and bard into flickering light, points to the top of the title page to a small drawing of a triangular eye. I think it was a picture of an eye, but now I don't think it is. It is in a rune, and it's not in Spellman's syllabary either. And it's been inked in. Somebody drew it. It isn't part of the book. Luna's dad was wearing that at Ron. And Bill and Fleur's wedding. What do you mean, wearing it? Around his neck, like an amulet. I, I didn't think much of it at the time. You know Luna, she's always got some mad thing or other she's carrying around. I just figured it ran in the family. Why would someone have drawn it in a children's book? As Hermione shakes her head, musing, Harry eyes her. Hermione, I've been thinking. I, I want to go to Godric's Hollow. It's where I was born. It's where my parents died. 
And it's exactly where you know who will expect you to go because it means something to you. But it means something to him too, Hermione. You know who nearly died there. Wouldn't that be just the kind of place he'd hide a horcrux? Hermione eyes him. Despite herself, she's, she knows he's right. It's dangerous, Harry. But I have to admit, recently even I've been thinking we might have to go. I think it's possible something else is hidden there. The sword. If Dumbledore didn't want it falling into the Ministry's hands, but wanted you to find it, what better place to hide it than the birthplace of the founder of Gryffindor himself? Godric Hollow is the birthplace of Godric Gryffindor. I mean, of course it is obvious, isn't it? Harry, did you ever even open a history of magic? Tossed it at Neville once when he was snoring. Might have popped open. She smiles and rises, collecting her books and blankets. Hermione. Words fail him. Hermione reaches out, lightly strokes his hair as she heads toward the tent. Don't ever let me give you a haircut again. It's here at Godric's Hollow Night. Golden streetlights glimmer along a narrow uh, road leading to the center of the town. Christmas decorations twinkle in its windows of small cottages, roofs blanketed in snow. Hermione and Harry apparate into view, wearing heavy coats and hats, scarves wrapped around their mouths. I still think we used, we should have used Polyjuice Potion. No, this is just where I was born. I'm not returning as someone else. She holds out his arm. Hermione takes it. They move on. It's your town center night. Harry and Hermione walk arm's length. A pub door opens briefly and laughter and music spill forth. Harry, I think it's Christmas Eve. Listen. Her voice is wistful. As they listen, voices carry from the church up ahead. Harry eyes the graveyard beyond. Do you think they'd be in there, my mom and dad? Yeah, I think they would. Here at church closer, the singing is full and rich. Here as Harry and Hermione peer, make their way through the snow toward the graveyard, Harry peers up at the stained glass windows glittering over him. It's here at graveyard night, Harry pushes through his gate and lets go of Hermione's hand. Row upon row of snowy tombstones stretch before him. As he heads off, Hermione studies them and follows. Hermione pauses by a large tombstone stretched with lichen. Harry? Is it? No, but look. Harry steps over, looks Kendra Dumbledore and her daughter Ariana. A quotation is etched in the granite. Where your treasure is, there will, there will your heart be also. Did you know he had a sister? Harry stares at the stone, his face a mask. No. Harry turns away, walks off. Hermione walks amid the stones, studying the names, then stops by an extremely old grave. She crouches. Lumos. Hermione plays the wand's light over the surface of the stone and stops. Though deeply worn by time, the symbol is unmistakable, the triangular eye. Hermione breaks the light over the name Ignatus Peveril. Ignatus? Hey, Harry! She stops. Harry stands several rows away, utterly still. Uh, Harry stares at the tombstone of his parents. James Potter, born March 27, 1960, died October 31, 1981. Lily Potter, born January 30, 1960, died October 31, 1981. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Hermione appears, looks at Harry, sees that tears are streaming down his cheeks. Hermione raises her wand, chases a circle in the air, and a wreath of Christmas roses blossom in the snow. Harry nods, staring at them. Happy Christmas, Hermione. Happy Christmas, Harry. Hermione laces her arm around his waist and he drapes uh, her arm over his shoulder. He stands silently, then... Harry? Yeah? Someone's watching us by the gate. Harry nods, careful not to look too soon, and glances up. A stooped figure, barely discernible in the drifting snow, stands in the shadows of the church. She, it is distinctly female and older, doesn't move initially, as if wanting Harry to see her, and turns away. Come on. Sierra Town Center. All light has left the sky. The stoop figure hobbles along past the pub where shadows play against the windows and muffled voices can be heard. Harry and Hermione follow. It's near a narrow alley. Hermione eyes the woman ahead and looks about the surroundings, feeling trapped. I don't think this is a good idea. We look like ordinary muggles. 
muzzle through just been laying flowers on your parents' grave. Just then, up ahead, the sweet woman holds up her hand and her mic. And Hermione and Harry stop. Seconds later, a group of snatchers passes by the alley. As they vanish, the woman continues on. Relax, this is right. I know it. Here, Lane. The woman hobbles on. The lane is lined with modest cottages with small and tidy gardens. Hermione barely gives them a glance, nervously eyeing the woman ahead before realizing she's walking alone. She turns, sees Harry standing several yards back, staring at the dark cottage. His garden overgrown with weeds, its roof entirely covered in ivy and snow. Hermione returns to him, looks, gasps. Oh my god, Harry. This is where they died, Hermione. This is where he murdered them. Hermione studies Harry's bitter profile within the house, careful not to disturb the moment with words. Absently, Harry places his fingers upon the locket at his chest. It is trembling out over so slightly. And without turning, while still staring at the house, Harry speaks. You're Matilda, aren't you? Hermione blinks, confused, and turns and jumps. The old woman is standing only yards away, watching them. Interior Bethilda Backshot's house. Night. The door rattles open, and tiny Bethilda Backshot hobbles inside, followed first by Harry, then Hermione, who wrinkles her nose. As Bethilda exits the room, Hermione glances about. Harry, I'm not sure about this. Hermione, she knew Dumbledore. She might have the sword. Besides, she's barely knee-high to a house elf. I think we can overpower her if, if it turns out ugly. There's something odd about her. And what's that smell? She's Gaga, remember? But Dilda returns, holding a box of matches. She strikes one, tries to light a candle, but her movement are clumsy. Here, let me do that. You have a lovely house, Miss Bagshot. Hermione eyes a photograph of a curiously compelling young girl, Ariana, then runs a finger along the table. It comes away thick with dust. She frowns, looks up, finds the Dilda watching her. Miss Bagshot, who is this man? Harry stands by a chest of drawers, holding the match over a group of photographs, cone in dust. The figures in the frames flit like ghosts behind veils. Harry picks one up, wipes away the dust with his hand, and in it a merry-faced boy looks out, his chair expression lying a particularly intense gaze. His name. Can you tell me his name? Matilda stares at the photographs solemnly, their tears up at Harry. Her eyes are thick with cataracts. Harry stares, unnerved, and Hermione walks over, looks at the picture. This is him, Hermione. The one I saw him in Gregovich's wand shop, the thief. Miss Bagshot, who is he? She looks at him, then jerks her head towards the stairs. She wants us to go upstairs. All right. As Hermione moves, Matilda shakes her head, points at Harry. She wants me to go alone. Why? It's all right. You stay here. Harry. Harry holds up his hand, silencing her, then follows Matilda. Just before he disappears, he looks back and winks, but Hermione doesn't look reassured. And tears serpentine staircase. Harry trails Matilda up a circular staircase, uncomfortably narrow and lined with books. Interior back shot, house, sitting room. Uh, closing the book, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore. A hand reaches and takes it, Hermione's hand, and notice the catch. Dear Batty, thanks for your help. You said everything, even if you don't remember. Rita. Interior back shot, house, bedroom. Harry enters a dark, low ceiling room. He wrinkles his nose at the smell and hears the door close behind him. The room plunges into darkness. Lumos. Harry sweeps the room and gives a start. The fill face wavers in the dark, only feet away, staring at him. Interior hallway, same time. Hermione hugs herself as she exits the sitting room and peers into the adjacent hallway. A, silver, a sliver of the kitchen can be seen and a faint buzzing heard. A strange shadow dances on one kitchen wall, specks moving. Hermione approaches. Interior back shot. Uh, bedroom. Harry watches Matilda moves closer, transfixed by her milky eyes. The horcrux on his chest twitches. Yes. Interior backshot house. Um, hallway kitchen. As Hermione nears the kitchen, she eyes the cloud of specks, warming those walls furiously. The buzzing grows to a hiss as the room comes to view. Hermione gasps. Clotted blood, blood streaks the sink and great white swaths of red stain the floor where hundreds of flies swarm. For you. Hermione's gaze rises to the ceiling to the heating vent which, from which a hissing voice had just come. Interior back to house bedroom, Harry's arms droop his wand tip painting the room with dots of light, his face wincing as the scar stings. But to the points to a dressing table cluttered with soiled laundry, her milky eyes fixed on Harry, something surfaced in her filmy corneas, 
or people changing from docks to stilts. Interior serpentine staircase, Hermione wands on and sends the stairs into her bachelor house bedroom. Harry appears at the foul laundry, moving closer and went out of the corner of his eye, but Tilda moves weirdly. He wheels and watches in horror as Matilda all body collapses, Nagini falls from her neck. As Harry raises his wand, Nagini strikes, piercing his forearm. His wand flies out his hand, his light swinging dizzily around the room. Nagini Nagini's tail swings about, knocks Harry's legs out from under him. Harry! As Harry rolls onto his back, gasping for breath, Nagini's massive body rolls over him, the horcrux kicking feverishly against his chest. As Harry roars in pain, the lenses of his glasses fracture. The bedroom door swings open, reveals Hermione silhouetted against the stairwell, wan poised. A flash of red light ricochets around the room, and Nagini's tail flips angrily about, shattering the bedroom window. Hermione dives aside, and Harry covers his face as the curtains burst into flames. The shards of glass shower the room in a rush of cold air. As Harry reclaims his wand and rises, Nagini's body coils in fury, splintering furniture and blasting holes into the walls. Confringo! As Hermione spells caroms over the trembling walls, we see both her and Harry reflected in the mirror, the leaf sweeping her toward the smoldering window as they pick themselves into the night. The mirror explodes and shards of glass reflecting bits of Hermione and Harry and the giant snake tumble in the night, slowly vanishing into nothingness. Steer River Woods, Force of Dean, weirdly quiet like the memory of a day long ago, a lone figure, Hermione walks from the river, the woods, a pail of water in hand, leaving silent footprints in the forest, in the frost that glitters to the ground. It's your dent before us, Dean. Darkness. For a moment, we hear nothing. Then Hermione's voice softly whispers. Harry. Harry, can you hear me? Yes. Good. That's good. We got away. Yes. Are you all right? I'm fine, but you've been sick. Rest. Rest a bit more. All stays dark. It's your tent, Force of Dean. Hermione sits reading a book by the fire. The hillside is glorious, overlooking the vast valley. You've outdone yourself this time. Hermione turns, finds Harry, standing outside the tent, admiring the view. He looks pale, battle-worn. Force of Dean. I came here once with my mom and dad, years ago. It's just how I remember it. The trees, the river. It's like nothing's changed. Oh, true, of course. Everything's changed. If I brought my parents here, they wouldn't recognize any of it. Not the trees, not the river, not... Where are they? Where are they? Wendell and Monica Wilkins now reside happily in Sydney, Australia. They have two dogs, run a small sweet shop, but floss daily. No children. She smiles and fades. Maybe we should just stay here, Harry. Grow old. Harry has no words. She inhales, shakes off her tears. Want to know who the boy in the photograph was? Will I know? Hermione holds up the book in her lap, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore. It was in Bathilda's sitting room. Rita Skeeter has sent it to her. Harry, it doesn't make for very nice reading. Who is he, Hermione, the thief? Did Dumbledore know him? Yes. Well? Four time. Tell me, Hermione, who is he? Scarlet Grindelwald. He's not very well known in Britain, but... There was a time before you know who. Hermione, I don't need to have a read a history of magic to know who Gerlard Grinwald is. Hermione nods, hands in the book, open to a photograph, and teenage Dumbledore laughing with another boy, Gerlard Grindelwald, the caption for the greater good, dark days, Dumbledore and Grindelwald. On the opposite page is a photograph of Grindelwald in later, in later days, clad in black, holding a jagged wand, no longer the carefully lad of youth. When Grindelwald was 17, he was expelled from Durmstrang. He started doing some twisted things at school, experiments. A few teachers had always protected him, but they couldn't anymore. After he left, he traveled for a while, then ended up in Godric's Hollow, where his great aunt lived, Bethilda Bagshaw. Get to the hard part, of mining. She introduced him to Dumbledore. It made sense. Dumbledore's mother had just died. Grindelwald was troubled, and they were both brilliant. They never really had anyone they could talk to on the same level. They did a lot of talking that summer, but they always returned to one particular subject. Harry looks up. Wizard rule over muggles. And Dumbledore believed it in it? Yes. Harry nods, looking at the photograph again. For the greater good, what does that mean? It was something Dumbledore came up with. 
he believed wizards were superior and should rule over muggles, but gently for their own good. Grindelwald took a more violent position. Harry shakes his head, staring at the book. It was a different time, Harry. It was one summer. Dumbledore was young. We're young, Hermione, and here we are risking our lives to fight against the very thing Dumbledore supported. He changed, Harry. Years later, it was Dumbledore who put Grindelwald in prison. Harry stares at the photograph, laughing to keep one last moment and toss the book away. Where's my wand? I'll take the wet watch. Hermione hesitates. Her expression makes him look apprehensive. Hermione, where's my wand? She points. They're lying by the fire as a shattered stick. She picks up gently. She's at his knee, nearly severed into two. One fragile strand of Phoenix Feather pulls it together. It's my fault. As we were leaving Godric's Hollow, I cast a curse and it rebounded. I'm sorry, Harry. I tried to mend it, but one's different. It's done. Maybe we can... It's done. His tone puts an end to it. She nods. Leave me yours. You get back in the warm and give me that. Harry just to lock it. Her money starts to speak, then simply hands it over. She starts to leave, pauses. He loved you, Harry. I know he loved you. She trails her fingers slightly over his hair and he closes his eyes. We, um, in the tent force, Dean, the fire is nearly embers. Harry sits with a frost encrusted blanket draped over his shoulders, staring bitterly into the dark forest. The sound is eerie. Shadows play in the trees. He peers through the tent flap and sees Hermione slumbering in the light of the small pool of flames. And slowly, light crawls briefly over the tent canvas and he turns to peer into the forest once more. Something seems to glimmer faintly, but so briefly as to seem a trick of the eye. The air is cold, gives texture to the darkness, makes it a living thing. And then it is there again, the light, pure and bright and silver, and moving through the trees toward him. Harry rises and the blanket slippers off his shoulders. Gripping Hermione's wand, he watches the light drift closer than shattered throughout the trees, momentarily blinding. Then it appears, a silver white doe, moon bright and dazzling. He gazes at Harry and he stands transfixed. And then the doe turns away. His voice cracks. No. It's your force of Dean Knight. Frost punches beneath Harry's feet as he dashes through the trees in pursuit of the silent doe up ahead, breath streaming from his lungs. She leads him deep into the forest until finally she stops, as does Harry. As he watches, she, she turns her beautiful head towards him and vanishes. For a moment, a ghost image of her, like a bread in a burn, hangs in the air, and then Harry's plunge into darkness. Lumos. Hermione's one tip ignites. Harry paints the clearing with light and something gleams, a small frozen pool. He crosses to it and looks down. He sees his own image reflected dully and then deeper within a silver cross. He looks closer and is a sword of Gryffindor. Harry steps back, blinks, is still bare. He glances about, painting the trees with light, looking to ensure he is alone and casts light upon the pool once more. Accio sword. Nothing. Harry walks about the pool again and again and then stops, crouches, and looks slowly down at his chest. The horcrux around his neck has begun to twitch. Harry places his fingers upon it briefly, then rises. Quickly with the fumbling fingers, he sheds his clothes and points Hermione's wand at the pool. Defendo. The pool's icy crust cracks, echoing in the silence. Chunks of dark ice rock the surface. Harry steps to the pool's edge, peers within and plunges. Interior icy pool forces a dean underwater. Screaming in the dark silence of chill water, he kicks down to the glimmering sword, grabs his hilt, and knocks it to the surface when the lock is chained against the coil, tightening like a snake about his neck. As the links bite into his throat, he releases the sword and begins to thrash it out, struggling to get his fingers under the chain, realizing it's no use. He reaches for the pool's edge, his fingers scrabbling desperately over the ice, but unable to gain purchase. Slowly, his hands go limp and slip from the ice back into the water, where he drips slowly down a slow trail of bubbles, escaping his mouth. Eyes half closed, and he peers upward, watching as the surface of the water grows slowly calm, peaceful, when no shadow appears, and a pair of hands shatter the glassy surface of the water, and Harry is pulled upward and out, landing. It's your force of Dean, face down on the frigid ground, tilting and retching. Hermione. A hand reaches in, strips the locket from his neck. Are you mental? Harry's eyes pop open, sending a few yards away, full dress and half drenched, clutching the sword of Gryffindor in one hand and locking the other. It's Ron. Harry just stares and begins to pull on his clothes. 
it was you. Well, yeah, a bit obvious, I think. And the doe, that, that was you as well? No, I reckoned it was you. My Patronus is a stag. Right. Atlas. Ron brings his arms up, vaguely pantomiming antlers, but the effect is lost. What would the sword and lock You didn't see anyone else? No, I, I did think maybe I saw something when I was running over there. Harry crossed to a pair of oaks growing close together. Anything? But I reckon whoever cast the doe put the sword in that pool hoping we'd find it. And we did, didn't we? The wee hangs in short air. Harry eyes Ron. Then steps forward and dangles a lot close to the sword and immediately begins to twitch. See that? It knows. It's afraid. Do it. What? No, Harry, that thing's bad for me. I can't handle it. I'm not making excuses for how I acted, but that thing affects me more than it affects you and Hermione. It made me think stuff. Stuff that I was thinking anyway, but it made everything worse. All the more reason. No, I can't. Then why are you here? Why did you come back? Harry's tone is hard, meant to wound. He stops Ron. He steps back, grips the sword with both hands. Harry nods. I'll have to speak to it in order for it to open. When it does, don't hesitate. I don't know what, what's in here, but it'll put up a fight. The bit, of, the bit of a riddle that was in his diary tried to kill me. Ron nods, and then Harry sweeps a layer of frost from the flat rock, lays the locket down. On three. One, two, three. Take me inside. Click. The twin doors of the locket snap open. Behind each glass window is a living eye. Blinks. Tom Riddle's eyes. Stab it, Ron. Now. Ron raises his voice, his trembling hands, poises the sword. Then a voice hisses from the horcrux. I have seen your heart, and it is mine. Don't listen to it. I have seen your dreams, Ronald Weasley. And I have seen your fears. Ron, don't listen to it. Least loved by the girl who craved a daughter. Least loved by the girl who prefers. Ron, step up. Uh, Ron, step it. Ron, it quivers in Harry's fingers, turning white hot. And then he releases it. As the eyes gleam scarlet, Harry glimpses in a flash of blinding light burst forth, leaving in its wake two figures flowing in the darkness. Ghost images of Harry and Hermione. We are better without you, happier without you. Who could look at you beside Harry Potter? What are you compared with the Chosen One? Ron stands transfixed, sword in hand, horrified. Ron, it lies. Stab it. Stab it. Your mother confessed that she would have preferred me as a son. Who wouldn't prefer him? What woman would take you? You are nothing, nothing, nothing to him. Ghost and Hermione, frightening yet beautiful, frightening yet beautiful, at, at twines herself around the ghost and carry her hair running like silk over her face as she leans forward and covers his mouth with hers. Do it, Ron. Kill it. Ron's head turns, head turns into Harry, and Harry freezes, traces a scarlet glint in Ron's eyes. He raises the sword high, and for a moment, Harry looks fearful. Um, then Ron pivots and brings the blade down hard, cleaving the locket. A scream echoes throughout the forest, and ghostly Harry and Hermione turn to dust, becoming one with the vapor drifting from Ron's mouth, and all is quiet. Harry's eyes the shadow locked it, then turns his gaze on Ron, who stands alone, sword dangling from the end of his arm, chest heaving. Harry scoops up the locket and examines it. Riddle's eyes are gone, the silk lining stained and faintly smoking. Ron lets the sword fall into the ground, drops to his knees. Harry steps forward and carefully places a hand upon his shoulder. After you left, she cried for a week. She's like my sister. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I left. You sort of made up for it tonight, getting the sword, finishing off the Horcrux. Saving your life. That too. They both stare at the remains of the locket. And just think of it. Only three to go. Interior tent for the Dean. The, the bowl of flames boils timidly now. Hermione still slumbers. Hermione. She stares, sits up, pushing her hair out of her face. She peers to the tent flat. It's your tent for the Dean. Harry sticks the sword into the ground. As Hermione emerges, she blinks against the brightness of the morning sun. Everything all right? Fine, actually. More than fine. He steps aside and Hermione sees Ron sitting at the edge of the camp. She stares mute and walks past Harry and ashes the campfire, stopping right in front of Ron. He raises a hand, smiles sheepishly. 
Hey. And then Hermione begins to punch him. What? Hey, ouch! You complete ass, Ronald Weasley! You crawl back here after all these weeks and say, Hey, where's my wand? Harry, where's my wand? Harry places his hand over his pocket. Um, I don't know. Harry Potter, you give me my wand. How come he's got your wand? Never mind why he's got my wand. What is that? She stares at the, she stares at the blank and locked it, dangling Ron's hand. You destroyed it? Hermione glances Harry. He indicates Ron. She turns back to Ron. He nods. She starts to speak when her eyes shift. She sees the sword stuck in the ground. And exactly how is it you have the sword of Gryffindor? It's a long story. Hermione ponders this, baffled, and looks back at Ron. Don't think this changes anything. No, of course not. I only destroyed a bloody freaking Horcrux. Why would that change anything? Do you know what it was like for me to hear those words coming from you? To see you doing those things? Ron stops. See me doing what things? Ron blinks, mortified. Hermione turns to Harry. What happened out there? It's a long story. Look, I wanted to come back the minute I left. I just didn't know how to find you. Exactly. How'd you find us? With this. Ron reaches into his pocket, pulls out the illuminator. It doesn't just turn off lights. I don't know exactly how it works, but Christmas morning, I, I was sleeping in this little pub. I'd given some snatches to slip the night before, me being a blood traitor and all. And Anyway, I was sleeping when I heard it. It? A voice. Ron turns to Hermione. Pulls it through the illuminator. Your voice, Hermione, coming out of this. And what, may I ask, did I say? My name. Just my name. Like a whisper. Hermione stands perfectly still and blushes. So I took this and I clicked it and this tiny ball of light appeared. And I knew. Knew what? Just knew, on account of Hermione's voice. And sure enough, it floated toward me, the ball of light, right to my chest, right, and then went straight through right here. Ron turns the point close to his heart. I could feel it inside me. It was warm, like the first sip of a good cup of tea, and I knew it would take me where I needed to go. So I disapparated and came out on this hillside. It was dark. I didn't have any idea where I was. I just had the hope one of you would show yourselves in the end, and you did. Into your tents, forced Dean. Harry lies in his bunk while Ron sits frostbite, warming his hands over a bowl of flames. I've always liked it, these flames Hermione makes. Harry peers at the bowl, then beyond a tin flat, sees Hermione sitting just as out, keeping watch. How long do you reckon she'll stay mad at me? Keep talking about the little ball of light touching your heart, she'll come around. It was true, every word. You're going to think I'm mental, but I think that's why Dumbledore left it to me, the little illuminator. I think he knew that at some point I'd need to find my way back, and she'd leave me. Harry eyes Ron pondering this, and suddenly, Ron jumps up, grabs his own ruck rucksack, and begins to fish through it. Bloody hell, I just realized you need a wand, right? Yeah. Well, I've got one. Here. It's Blackthorn, ten inches, nothing special, but I reckon it'll do. I took it off a of Snatcher a few weeks back. Don't tell Hermione, but they're a bit dim, Snatchers. This one was definitely pot troll. The smell off him. Harry points a wand at the flames. And Gorgio. The flames flare massively, and Ron leaves black, leaves back. Woof. Reduce you. As the flames subside, Ron pats down a small flare up on the canvas. What's going on in there? Nothing. Nothing. Maybe a bit more. We need to talk. Ron wheels, sees Hermione standing in the mouth of the tent, life and lies, in hand, looking at Harry. Right? I want to go and see Zeny Xenophilius Lovegood. Sorry? See this? It's the letter Dumbledore wrote to Grindelwald. Look at the signature. It's the mark again. Hermione turns the book in Harry's direction. Dumbledore replaced the A in Albus with a triangular eye. It keeps cropping up. Here, in Beetle the Bard, in the graveyard in Godric's Hollow. What? Hermione looks at Harry, who is staring hard at the book. Suddenly, we are... Here in village streets, um, moving through the village streets again, past the cloaked figures, turning the, down the narrowing alleyway that leads toward the regular village's swan shop and holding on the triangular symbol, scratched crudely onto the wall. Harry, in the tent, Harry blinks. Jesus, it was there too. Where? Outside Gregovich's wand shop on the alley wall. Hey. 
They all looked down at the symbol, etching Dumbledore's fine hand in the book. Harry, you don't have a clue where the next Horcrux is, and neither do I. But this, this means something. I'm sure of it. Money's right. I think we ought to go see Lovegood. What say we vote on it? Those in favor? Ron hand flies into the air. Harry eyes him annoyingly. Hermione rolls her eyes and lifts her hand as well. Sorry, Harry. Looks like it's Hermione and me this time. Sarah Hillside, late afternoon. The sun hangs low over a hillside gloriously free of the snow. Ron leads the way far ahead of Harry and Hermione. You're not still mad at him, are you? I'm always mad at him. As he rises, a strange looking house appears in the distance. Etched like a great black cylinder against the sky, seeing it, Ron turns back, grinning as he calls out. Luna? Harry and Hermione take a look. Luna? Luna? Exterior Lovegood House, front door, late afternoon. A sign is tacked to the door, spelled to the nails. The quibbler, editor, ex Lovegood. Hermione taps three times. Keep off the dirigible plums. Hermione turns, gives him an odd look. Ron points to the sign, keep all the dirigible plums. Just then, the door swings open and Xenophilius loved it appears barefoot wearing a soiled nightshirt. What is it? Who are you? What do you want? Seeing Harry, loved this job, goes slack in shock. Hello, Mr. Lovegood. I'm Harry Potter. We met a few months back. Loved his eyes drift to Harry's scar. Would it be okay if we came in? I it won't be it won't take long enough, sir, I I promise. Interior Lovegood House, press room, great tottering floors of quibbler back issues rise to the ceiling while an old-fashioned wooden, wooden printing press chugs away in the center of the room, spitting out new ones. Excuse me. As Lovegood steps into the wheezing press, the trio glance as past quibblers laying about. Muggle murders rise, dozens die as death eaters attack. Harry in hiding. Where is the chosen one? You know who claims another victim. Quidditch World Cup canceled amid death eaters' threats. Abruptly, the press goes silent, and Lovegood turns. So, what brings you here, Mr. Potter? Well, sir, we need some help. Ah, help, I see. Well, yes, well, the thing is, helping Harry Potter may have a danger these days. The trio exchange glances. Aren't you the one who keeps telling everyone it's their first duty to help Harry? I've expressed that view, yes, in the past. Just give me one moment. I, I shall return shortly, and I'll try to help you. Lovegood dashes from the room. What's going on here? He's mental. Let's face it, Luna's always good value, but she's nutty as squirrel fool. Just in her mighty gas, pointing to an enormous spiral of horn mounted on the wall. Do you see that? Of course, it's massive, isn't it? No, don't go near it! Harry stops. It's an enrumpent horn. It's a Class B tradable material. Harry and Ron exchange a uh, she's mental glance. Yeah, all right. Just then, Lovegood returns with a tray rattling in cups. Where are you all in a fusion of gunny roots? We make it ourselves. Where's Luna, sir? Luna? Oh, um, she'll be along. Now, can I help you, Mr. Potter? Well, sir, it's about something you were wearing around your neck at the wedding. A symbol. Oh, you mean this? Lovegood reaches in the nightshirt and pulls out the chain with a triangular eye. Yes, exactly. What? what what we wondered, sir, is, well, what is it? What is it? Well, the sound of Deathly Hollows, of course. The what? Deathly Hollows. I assume you're all familiar with the tale of the three brothers. Yes. yes. No. Harry looks at the others, then Hermione moves into her beaded bag and pulls out the tails of the beetle and the bard. It's in here. Well, there's no real reason to go on unless one is familiar with the tale. Why don't you read it aloud, Miss? Granger. Well, all right. There were once three brothers who were traveling along a lonely, winding road at twilight. Midnight. Mom always said midnight. But twilight's fine. Better, actually. In time, the brothers reached the river too treacherous to pass. As Hermione continues, Lovegood looks out the window. A crow cycles into view, and we follow it the sky darkening. Story exterior river bridge twilight as the crow swoops over a river to reveal three silhouettes. But being learned in the magical arts, the three brothers simply waved their wands and made a bridge. They were halfway across it when they found the path blocked by a hooded figure. A bridge magically materializes and the three figures begin to cross and the hooded figure appears. It was death and he felt cheated. 
the travelers usually drowned in the river. But death was cunning. He granted each brother a wish for their cleverness. The oldest, who was a combative man, asked for one more powerful than any in existence. So death fashioned one from an elder tree on the banks of the river. All this is dramatized in surreal silhouette. The second brother, who was an arrogant man, asked for the power to recall others from death. So death plucked a stone from the river. Finally, death turned to the third brother. A humble man, he asked for something that would make him disappear. And so it was that death handed over his own cloak of invisibility. Death then stepped aside and the brothers went their separate ways. You see the brothers cross the bridge in part. The first brother traveled to a distant village where, with elder wand in hand, he killed a wizard with whom he had once quarreled. Proceeding to an inn, he bragged of his invincibility. But that very night... You see a wizard in shadow slip into a room, knife in hand. Another wizard crept upon him as he lay sleeping. He took the elder one and slit the brother's throat for good measure. And so death took the first brother for his own. You see the second brother approach a cottage. Meanwhile... The second brother journeyed to his home, where he took out the stone and turned it thrice in hand. To his delight, the girl he had once hoped to marry before her untimely death appeared before him. Yet soon she turned sad and cold, for she did not belong in the mortal world. Driven mad with hopeless longing, the second brother killed himself so as to join her. And so death took the second brother. You see death etched upon a bleak hillside. As for the third brother, Death searched for many years, but was never able to find him. Only when he attained a great age did the younger brother shed the cloak of invisibility and give it to his son. He then greeted Death as an old friend and went with him gladly, departing this life as equals. As Death and the third brother retreat, the crow returns, beating into the sky, which lightens and we pull back. Interior in Lovegood house, pestering to find Xenophilia's love good staring out at the window. The sun has nearly vanished over the lip of the hill. Well, there you are. Those are the different hollows. Sorry, I, I still don't know. I still don't really understand. Love good turns and takes the quill and parts and draws a straight vertical line. Elder Walt. Then has a circle on top of the line. The resurrection stone. And closes both on a triangle. The cloak of invisibility. Together, they make the deathly hollows. Together, they make one master of death. The trio stare at the symbol. Mr. Lovegood, does the Peveril family have anything to do with the deathly hollows? That was the name on the grave with the mark on it in Godric's hollow. Ignotus Peveril. Notice and his brothers Cadmus and Antioch are thought to be the original owners of the hollows and therefore an inspiration for the story. Lovegood's focus abruptly wavers, saddens in his eyes, then he blinks, eyes a tea kettle. Ah, but the tea's going grown cold. Excuse me, I'll be right back. Get out of here once he's back. I'm not touching this stuff, hot or cold. Which one would you choose if you could, or of the Deathly Hallows? It's obvious, isn't it? glance at each other, amused. You're supposed to say the cloak. Who wants to spend all day being invisible? Dead boring, if you ask me, but an unbeatable wand? Its owner grew drunk with power and was murdered. Yeah, but imagine what a short, wicked life you'd lead. Why the stone? Oh, well. <laughs> Why the stone? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you could bring people back, couldn't you? Mad-Eye, Dumbledore, Sirius, anybody. But according to the story, they don't want to come back. It's all rubbish anyway. There's no such thing as the Deathly Hallows. But I have one, the Invisibility Cloak my father left me. There have always been cloaks. Not like Harry's. I've seen a fair few. Dad used to bring them home, the ones from the Ministry confiscated from petty thieves and the like. They always had holes of tears. Harry's is different. It's perfect. And I think I've actually held the resurrection stone in my hand that night in Dumbledore's office when he showed me the ring he destroyed the Horcrux. It had a symbol on it. Now I think it was the mark of the hollow, hollows. 
The trio stands silently when Lovegood returns. Miss Lovegood, thank you, sir. You forgot the water. Water? For the tea? Didn't I? How silly of you. No matter, sir. We, we really ought to be going. No, you must. Sir. My only hope. They were angry with me about what I've been writing. So they took her. They took my Luna. But it's really you they want. Who took her, sir? Her mighty eyes and printing press, a copy of Quibble lies stuck under a roller. She reaches out, pulls it free, the ink shrinking over the cover over Harry's face, and plays the headline, Undesirable Number One. Him. Surely you call him you know who. But his real name, of course, is Voldemort. No! Still instantly out the window, figures on broomsticks appear in the sky, jetting directly towards the house. Harry, Ron, and her mighty hit the floor. Ropes of light legal straight off the window sill. A printing press explodes, raining quibblers everywhere like a flock of doves, smoking with flames. Lovegood weighs madly from the window. Stop! I've got him! Lovegood is blasted off his feet by a stunning spell, so the great the chain around his neck flies across the room and sells at Harry's feet. Harry glances down, watches the symbol of the Deathly Hallows dissolve like Mercury, and looks up, sees Lovegood freak out the door. Ron! Harry! Take my hand! Harry and Ron begin to crawl onto her knees toward Hermione when another volley of spells ricochet about the wind and ping, strike the great big girdy root teapot as Hermione watches it flies into the air, tumbling end over end toward the erumpent horn. Harry's hand closes on hers. Ron reaches out and the teapot strikes the erumpent horn. Uh, Exterior Love Good House continues acting. There's a colossal explosion. The second floor of the black cylinder wrap ruptures. Quibblers belch into the air like confetti as Lovegood narrowly escapes and the Death Eaters are engulfed and Harry and Ron and Hermione in the riverbank tumble into view and roll to their feet, barely visible in the darkness. That treacherous old bleeder! Is there no one we can trust? It kidnapped Luna because he supported me. He was just desperate. Ron says nothing and spits, clearing the grit from his teeth and peers through the river. Unlike the raging force it was the last time they were here, is little more than a trickle now. The trees are eerily quiet. I'll do the enchantments. Ron takes out his wand when her mighty raises her wand, her hand stopping him. Her eyes rise, her breath catches. Ron and Harry look, clinging to the branches of the trees above, almost as if part of the trees themselves are snatchers. A wand blooms above, illuminates the face of Scabior. Her mighty's red scarf, now faded and filthy, dangles from his neck. He presses into his grimy nose, inhales, and grins. Hello, beautiful. It's your forest dust. Harry, Ron, and Hermione dash through trees as they diverge to cutting back and forth between the three. Hermione swift as the wind flickers through the trees as Scabior pursues her. Harry slashes to the river, looks up, and sees a snatch of sweep across the divide from one tree to another. Ron pounds through the thick brush over a fallen tree. The forest grows more dense. The shadows thicken. Spells splinter to the trees. Ropes of light lace night. Hermione stumbles and gains her footing, finds herself in a clearing. Another figure pulse toward her. Harry. They freeze briefly, then celebrating explodes with light as spells ricochet. They hit the ground. Harry the snatch is closing in. Harry looks to Hermione. The tip of her wand gla glows and her face blooms in the darkness, looking, looking mildly demonic. She reaches out, strips his glasses from his face, and points her wand at him. A burst of white light strikes him in the eyes as her wand goes dark. Exterior fortress night. He's flying up toward the fortress, gliding through the high walls, up to the topmost window of the highest power. He passed through the window a little more than a slit, and interior cell begins action. Finds a skeletal figure lying beneath a ragged blanket. The figure stirs, looks up, and grins with broken teeth. It is the young man, the thief, grown old, Grindelwald. Ah, uh, Tom, I thought you would come one day, but surely you must know I no longer have what you seek. Shadow of Voldemort falls across Grindelwald. If not you, then who? So innocent, Tom. Like a schoolboy. There's so much you don't understand. Tell me, Grindelwald. Tell me where to find it. Tell me who possesses it. The name, Grindelwald. The name! Can't you guess, Tom? Lies with him, of course. Buried within the earth. It is he who possesses it, even in death. Your old friend and mine, Dumbledore. 
obscure forest dust. Harry blinks into this woolen blur, appears at Hermione, whispers quickly. They exist, the hollows. Hermione looks at him expectantly. He nods, his face shrouded in shadow, barely visible. But he only wants the one, the last one. That's what he's been looking for. He's saying. He knows where it is. You know who. He'll have it by the end of the night. He's found the Elder Wand. Hermione stares in stunned disbelief. Figures emerge from the trees. Wand is shoved to the ground next to them. Scapier strips carrying Hermione off their wands. Don't touch her. A fist hits Ron hard. It's way back. Stop it! Your boyfriend will get worse than that if he doesn't behave, lovely. Scabula paints her face with light and passes it on Harry. Harry peers up, his eyes won't slit, his face horribly misshapen. What happened to you, ugly? Harry's hand finds his face, feels the lumps. What's your, what's your name? Dudley Vernon Dudley. Check the list. And you, Ginger? Dan Shumpike. Like hell you are. We know Skinny Stan. Try again. Rayback hits his boot to Ron's neck, presses harder. Weasley. Barney Weasley. Weasley, eh? Wouldn't be related to that blood traitor, Arthur Weasley, would we? Piss off. Arthur Weasley's ten times the wizard you are. Worth ten times you if I can find him. Wasn't you that tipped him off, was it? Ron stays mute. Stab your attention, Hermione. How about you, lovely? What do they call you? Penelope Clearwater. Half-blood. Stab your strokes the nape of Hermione's neck and takes her hair in hand. Mix it. You smell like vanilla. Penelope, I think you're going to be my favorite. There's no Vernon Dudley on here. Without saying Scabby, you're turning some Hermione to Harry. Oh, that ugly. In this stage, you're lying. How come you don't want us to know who you are? Hmm? The list is wrong. I told you who I am. I am. Scabby puts a finger to his lips, silencing Harry. His wand probing Harry's face more closely. Change of plans, boys. We won't be taking this lot to the ministry. Sierra night, sky night. The sea of treetops shift airily above as you sweep over exterior Malfoy Manor. Night. Scabby and the others escort Harry, Ron, and Hermione past a few hedges. Hermione eyes a white peacock, looking like a ghostly lawn ornament. Harry whispers. What did you put on me? Singing jinx. How long will it last? Not long. Harry glances down, sees his glasses cupped in Hermione's palm as he uh, slips them into his pocket. The group suddenly slows up ahead uh, on the other side of the gate. Bellatrix, Lucius, and Narcissa approach. Scabior grabs Harry's arm, pushes his face up to the iron bars. Bellatrix steps close. Show me. Um, Scabior reaches out and pushes Harry's hair off his forehead. Bellatrix points her wand, illuminating the skin. Slowly she smiles, despite the swelling, one intriguing feature can be seen. A scar in the shape of a lightning bolt. We hold. Then, cut to black. The end. Woo. All right. Almost there. Woo. All right. Thanks for joining us on this reading of Devil Halls Part 1. Come back and, and join us next time where we conclude the Harry Potter saga in Harry Potter and Deathly Halls Part 2. We're close to the end. Bye-bye. See you next time.